Section 161 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 161. A Sister's Confession. Marguerite de Thorel was dying. Although she was only 56 years old, she looked at least 75. She gasped for breath, her face whiter than the sheets, and had spasms of violent shivering, with her face convulsed and her eyes haggard, as though she saw a frightful vision. Her elder sister, Suzanne, six years older than herself, was sobbing on her knees beside the bed. A small table close to the dying woman's couch bore, on a white cloth, two lighted candles, for the priest was expected at any moment to administer extreme unction and the last communion. The apartment wore that melancholy aspect common to death chambers, a look of despairing farewell. Medicine bottles littered the furniture, linen lay in the corners into which it had been kicked or swept. The very chairs looked, in their disarray, as if they were terrified and had run in all directions. Death, terrible death, was in the room, hidden, awaiting his prey. The history of the two sisters was an affecting one. It was spoken of far and wide. It had drawn tears from many eyes. Suzanne, the elder, had once been passionately loved by a young man whose affection she returned. They were engaged to be married, and the wedding day was at hand when Henri de Saint-Pierre had suddenly died. The young girl's despair was terrible, and she took an oath never to marry. She faithfully kept her vow and adopted widow's weeds for the remainder of her life. But one morning, her sister, her little sister Marguerite, then only twelve years old, threw herself into Suzanne's arms, sobbing, "'Sister, I don't want you to be unhappy. I don't want you to mourn all your life. I'll never leave you. Never, never, never. I shall never marry either. I'll stay with you always. Always!' Suzanne kissed her, touched by the child's devotion, though not putting any faith in her promise. But the little one had kept her words, and despite her parents' remonstrances, despite her elder sister's prayers, never married. She was remarkably pretty and refused many offers. She never left her sister. They spent their whole life together without a single day's separation. They went everywhere together and were inseparable. But Marguerite was pensive, melancholy, sadder than her sister, as if her sublime sacrifice had undermined her spirits. She grew older more quickly, her hair was white at thirty, and she was often ill, apparently stricken with some unknown wasting malady. And now she would be the first to die. She had not spoken for twenty-four hours, except to whisper at daybreak, "'Send at once for the priest.' And she had since remained lying on her back, convulsed with agony, her lips moving as if unable to utter the dreadful words that rose in her heart, her face expressive of a terror distressing to witness. Suzanne, distracted with grief, her brow pressed against the bed, wept bitterly, repeating over and over again the words, "'Margot, my poor Margot, my little one!' She had always called her my little one, while Marguerite's name for the elder was invariably sister." A footstep sounded on the stairs. The door opened. An acolyte appeared, followed by the aged priest and his surplice. As soon as she saw him, the dying woman sat up suddenly in bed, opened her lips, stammered a few words, and began to scratch the bedclothes as if she would have made hole in them. Father Simon approached, took her hand, kissed her on the forehead, and said in a gentle voice, "'May God pardon your sins, my daughter. Be of good courage. Now is the moment to confess them. Speak.' Then Marguerite, shivering from head to foot so that the very bed shook with her nervous movements, gasped, "'Sit down, sister, and listen.' The priest stooped toward the prostrate Suzanne, raised her to her feet, placed her in a chair, and taking a hand of each of the sisters, pronounced, "'Lord God, send them strength. Shed thy mercy upon them.' And Marguerite began to speak. The words issued from her lips one by one, hoarse, jerky, tremulous. "'Pardon, pardon, sister, pardon me.' Oh, if only you knew how I have dreaded this moment all my life. Suzanne faltered through her tears. But why have I to pardon, little one? You have given me everything, sacrificed all to me. You are an angel. But Marguerite interrupted her. Be silent, be silent. Let me speak. Don't stop me. It is terrible. Let me tell all to the very end, without interruption. Listen. You remember? You remember Henry? Suzanne trembled and looked at her sister. The younger one went on. In order to understand, you must hear everything. I was twelve years old, only twelve. You remember, don't you? And I was spoiled. I did just as I pleased. You remember how everybody spoiled me? Listen, the first time he came, he had on his riding boots. He dismounted, saying that he had a message for father. You remember, don't you? Don't speak. Listen. When I saw him, I was struck with admiration. I thought him so handsome, and I stayed in a corner of the drawing room all the time he was talking. Children are strange and terrible. Yes, indeed, I dreamt of him. He came again, many times. I looked at him with all my eyes, all my heart. I was large for my age and much more precocious than anyone suspected. He came often. I thought only of him. I often whispered to myself, Henry, Henry de Saint-Pierre. 
Then I was told that he was going to marry you. That was a blow. Oh, sister, a terrible blow. Terrible. I wept through all three sleepless nights. He came every afternoon after lunch. You remember, don't you? Don't answer. Listen. You used to make cakes that he was very fond of. With flour, butter, and milk? Oh, I know how to make them. I could make them still if necessary. He would swallow them at one mouthful and wash them down with a glass of wine, saying, Delicious! Do you remember the way he said it? I was jealous. Jealous! Your wedding day was drawing near. It was only a fortnight distant. I was distracted. I said to myself, He shall not marry Suzanne. No, he shall not. He shall marry me when I am old enough. I shall never love anyone half so much. But one evening, ten days before the wedding, you went for a stroll with him in the moonlight before the house, and yonder, under the pine tree, the big pine tree, he kissed you, kissed you, and held you in his arms so long, so long. You remember, don't you? It was probably the first time. You were so pale when you came back to the drawing room. I saw you. I was there in the shrubbery. I was mad with rage. I would have killed you both if I could. I said to myself, he shall never marry Suzanne. Never. He shall marry no one. I could not bear it. And all at once I began to hate him intensely. Then do you know what I did? Listen. I had seen the gardener prepare pellets for killing stray dogs. He would crush a bottle into small pieces with a stone and put the ground glass into a ball of meat. I stole a small medicine bottle from mother's room. I ground it fine with a hammer and hid the glass in my pocket. It was a glistening powder. Then the next day, when you had made your little cakes, I opened them with a knife and inserted the glass. He ate three. I ate one myself. I threw the six others in the pond. The two swans died three days later. You remember? Oh, don't speak. Listen. Listen. I, I alone did not die, but I have always been ill. Listen. He died. You know. Listen. That was not the worst. It was afterward, later. Always the most terrible. Listen. My life, all my life, such torture. I said to myself, I will never leave my sister, and on my deathbed I will tell her all. And now I have told, and I have always thought of this moment, the moment when all would be told. Now it has come. It is terrible. Oh, sister. I have always thought, morning and evening, day and night, I shall have to tell her some day. I waited. The horror of it. It is done. Say nothing. Now I am afraid. I am afraid. Oh, supposing I should see him again, by and by when I am dead. See him again? Only to think of it. I dare not, yet I must. I am going to die. I want you to forgive me. I insist on it. I cannot meet him without your forgiveness. Oh, tell her to forgive me, father. Tell her. I implore you. I cannot die without it. She was silent and lay back, gasping for breath, still plucking at the sheets with her fingers. Suzanne had hidden her face in her hands and did not move. She was thinking of him whom she had loved so long. What a life of happiness they might have had together. She saw him again in the dim and distant past, that past forever lost. Beloved, dead, how the thought of them rends the heart. Oh, that kiss, his only kiss. She had retained the memory of it in her soul. And after that, nothing, nothing more throughout her whole existence. The priest rose suddenly, and in a firm, compelling voice said, Mademoiselle Suzanne, your sister is dying. Then Suzanne, raising her tear-stained face, put her arms around her sister, and kissing her fervently, exclaimed, I forgive you, I forgive you, little one. End of section 161. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 162 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 162, Coco. Throughout the whole countryside, the Lucas farm was known as the manor. No one knew why. The peasants doubtless attached to this word, manor, a meaning of wealth and splendor, for this farm was undoubtedly the largest, richest, and the best managed in the whole neighborhood. The immense court, surrounded by five rows of magnificent trees, which sheltered the delicate apple trees from the harsh wind of the plain, enclosed in its confines long brick buildings used for storing fodder and grain, beautiful stables built of hard stone and made to accommodate thirty horses, and a red brick residence which looked like a little chateau. Thanks to the good care taken, the manure heaps were as little offensive as such things can be, the watchdogs lived in kennels, and countless poultry paraded through the tall grass. Every day at noon, fifteen persons, masters, farmhands, and the women folks seated themselves around the long kitchen table where the soup was brought in steaming in a large blue-flowered bowl. The beasts, horses, cows, pigs, and sheep were fat, well-fed, and clean. Maitre Lucas, a tall man who was getting stout, would go round three times a day, overseeing everything and thinking of everything. A very old white horse, which the mistress wished to keep until its natural death, because she had brought it up and had always used it, and also because it recalled many happy memories, 
was housed through sheer kindness of heart at the end of the stable. A young scamp about fifteen years old, Isidore Duval by name, and called for convenience Zidor, took care of this pensioner, giving him his measure of oats and fodder in winter, and in summer was supposed to change his pasturing pace four times a day, so that he might have plenty of fresh grass. The animal, almost crippled, lifted with difficulty his legs, large at the knees and swollen above the hoofs. His coat, which was no longer curried, looked like white hair, and his long eyelashes gave his eyes a sad expression. When Zidor took the animal to pasture, he had to pull on the rope with all his might because it walked so slowly, and the youth, bent over and out of breath, would swear at it, exasperated at having to care for this old nag. The farmhands, noticing the young rascal's anger against Coco, were amused and would continually talk of the horse to Zidor in order to exasperate him. His comrades would make sport with him. In the village, he was called Coco Zidor. The boy would fume, feeling an unholy desire to revenge himself on the horse. He was a thin, long-legged, dirty child with thick, coarse, bristly red hair. He seemed only half-witted and stuttered as though ideas were unable to form in his thick, brute-like mind. For a long time, he had been unable to understand why Coco should be kept, indignant at seeing things wasted on this useless beast. Since the horse could no longer work, it seemed to him unjust that he should be fed. He revolted at the idea of wasting oats, oats which were so expensive, on this paralyzed old plug. And often, in spite of the orders of Mantra Lucas, he would economize on the nag's food, only giving him half measure. Hatred grew in his confused, childlike mind, the hatred of a stingy, mean, fierce, brutal, and cowardly peasant. When summer came, he had to move the animal about in the pasture. It was some distance away. The rascal, angrier every morning, would start with his dragging step across the wheat fields. The men working in the fields would shout to him, jokingly, "'Hey, Zidor, remember me to Coco.' He would not answer, but on the way he would break off a switch, and, as soon as he had moved the old horse, he would let it begin grazing. Then, treacherously sneaking up behind it, he would slash its legs. The animal would try to escape, to kick, to get away from the blows, and run around in a circle about its rope, as though it had been enclosed in a circus ring. And the boy would slash away furiously, running along behind, his teeth clenched in anger. Then he would go away slowly without turning around, while the horse watched him disappear, his ribs sticking out, panting as a result of his unusual exertions. Not until the blue blouse of the young peasant would out of sight would he lower his head to the grass. As the nights were now warm, Coco was allowed to sleep out of doors in the field behind the little wood. Zidor alone went to see him. The boy threw stones at him to amuse himself. He would sit down on an embankment about ten feet away and would stay there for half an hour, from time to time throwing a sharp stone at the old horse, which remained standing tied before his enemy, watching him continually and not daring to eat before he was gone. This one thought persisted in the mind of the young scamp. Why feed this horse which is no longer good for anything? It seemed to him that this old nag was stealing the food of the others, the goods of man and God, that he was even robbing him, Zidor, who was working. Then, little by little each day, the boy began to shorten the length of rope which allowed the horse to graze. The hungry animal was growing thinner and starving. Too feeble to break his bonds, he would stretch his head out toward the tall, green, tempting grass, so near that he could smell, and yet so far that he could not touch it. But one morning Zidor had an idea. It was not to move Coco any more. He was tired of walking so far for that old skeleton. He came, however, in order to enjoy his vengeance. The beast watched him anxiously. He did not beat him that day. He walked around him with his hands in his pockets. He even pretended to change his place, but he sank the stake in exactly the same hole and went away overjoyed with his invention. The horse, seeing him leave, neighed to call him back, but the rascal began to run, leaving him alone, entirely alone in this field, well tied down and without a blade of grass within reach. Starving, he tried to reach the grass, which he could touch with the end of his nose. He got on his knees, stretching out his neck and his long, drooling lips. All in vain. The old animal spent the whole day in useless, terrible efforts. The sight of all that green food, which stretched out on all sides of him, served to increase the gnawing pangs of hunger. The scamp did not return that day. He wandered through the woods in search of nests. The next day, he appeared upon the scene again. Kogo, exhausted, had lain down. When he saw the boy, he got up, expecting at last to have his place changed. But the little peasant did not even touch the mallet, which was lying on the ground. He came nearer, looked at the animal, threw at his head a clump of earth which flattened out against the white hair, and he started off again, whistling. The horse remained standing as long as he could see him. Then, knowing that his attempts to reach the nearby grass would be hopeless, he once more lay down on his side and closed his eyes. The following day, Isidore did not come. When he did come at last, he found Coco still stretched out. He saw that he was dead. Then he remained standing, looking at him, pleased with what he had done, surprised that it should already be all over. He touched him with his foot, lifted one of his legs, and then let it drop. 
sat on him and then remained there, his eyes fixed on the grass, thinking of nothing. He returned to the farm, but did not mention the accident, because he wished to wander about at the hours when he used to change the horse's pasture. He went to see him the next day. At his approach, some crows flew away. Countless flies were walking over the body and were buzzing around it. When he returned home, he announced the event. The animal was so old that nobody was surprised. The master said to two of the men, "'Take your shovels and dig a hole right where he is.' The men buried the horse at the place where he had died of hunger, and the grass grew thick, green, and vigorous, fed by the poor body. End of section 162. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 163 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 163, Dead Woman's Secret. The woman had died without pain, quietly, as a woman should whose life had been blameless. Now she was resting in her bed, lying on her back with her eyes closed, her features calm, her long white hair carefully arranged as though she had done it up ten minutes before dying. The whole pale countenance of the dead woman was so collected, so calm, so resigned, that one could feel what a sweet soul had lived in that body, what a quiet existence this old soul had led, how easy and pure the death of this parent had been. Kneeling beside the bed, her son, a magistrate with inflexible principles, and her daughter Marguerite, known as Sister Eulalie, were weeping as though their hearts would break. She had, from childhood up, armed them with a strict moral code, teaching them religion without weakness, and duty without compromise. He, the man, had become a judge and handled the law as a weapon with which he smote the weak without pity. She, the girl, influenced by the virtue which had bathed her in this austere family, had become the bride of the church through her loathing for man. They had hardly known her father, knowing only that he had made their mother most unhappy, without being told any other details. The nun was wildly kissing the dead woman's hand, an ivory hand as white as the large crucifix lying across the bed. On the other side of the long body, the other hand seemed still to be holding the sheet in the death grasp, and the sheet had preserved the little creases as a memory of those last movements which precede eternal immobility. A few light taps on the door caused the two sobbing heads to look up, and the priest, who had just come from dinner, returned. He was red and out of breath from his interrupted digestion, for he had made himself a strong mixture of coffee and brandy in order to combat the fatigue of the last few nights and of the wake which was beginning. He looked sad, with that assumed sadness of the priest for whom death is a breadwinner. He crossed himself, and approaching with his professional gesture, "'Well, my poor children, I have come to help you pass these last sad hours.' But Sister Eulalie suddenly arose. "'Thank you, Father, but my brother and I prefer to remain alone with her. This is our last chance to see her, and we wish to be all together, all three of us, as we—we we used to be when we were small and our poor mother—' Grief and tears stopped her. She could not continue." Once more serene, the priest bowed, thinking of his bed. As you wish, children. He kneeled, crossed himself, prayed, arose, and went out quietly, murmuring, She was a saint. They remained alone, the dead woman and her children. The ticking of the clock, hidden in the shadow, could be heard distinctly, and through the open window drifted in the sweet smell of hay and of woods, together with the soft moonlight. No other noise could be heard over the land, except the occasional croaking of the frog or the chirping of some belated insect. An infinite peace, a divine melancholy, a silent serenity surrounded this dead woman, seemed to be breathed out from her into appease nature itself. Then the judge, still kneeling, his head buried in the bedclothes, cried in a voice altered by grief and deadened by the sheets and blankets, Mama, Mama, Mama! And his sister, frantically striking her forehead against the woodwork, convulsed, twitching and trembling as in an epileptic fit, moaned, Jesus, Jesus, Mama, Jesus! And both of them, shaken by a storm of grief, gasped and choked. The crisis slowly calmed down and they began to weep quietly, just as on the sea when a calm follows a squall. A rather long time passed and they arose and looked at their dead mother. And the memories, those distant memories, yesterday so dear, today so torturing, came to their minds with all the little forgotten details, those little intimate familiar details which bring back to life the one who has left. They recalled to each other circumstances, words, smiles, intonations of the mother who was no longer to speak to them, they saw her happy and calm. They remembered things which she had said, and the little motion of the hand, like beating time, which she often used when emphasizing something important. And they loved her as they had never loved her before. They measured the depth of their grief, and thus they discovered how lonely they would find themselves. It was their prop, their guide, their whole youth, all the best part of their lives which was disappearing. 
It was their bond with life, their mother, their mama, the connecting link with their forefathers, which they would henceforth miss. They now became solitary, lonely beings. They could no longer look back. The nun said to her brother, You remember how Mama used always to read through her old letters? They are all there in that drawer. Let us in turn read them. Let us live her whole life through tonight beside her. It would be like a road to the cross, like making the acquaintance of her mother, of our grandparents whom we never knew, but those letters are there and of whom she spoke. Do you remember? Out of the drawer they took about ten little packages of yellow paper, tied with care and arranged one beside the other. They threw these relics on the bed and chose one of them on which the word father was written. They opened it and read it. It was one of those old-fashioned letters which one finds in old family desk drawers, those epistles which smell of another century. The first one started, My dear, another one, my beautiful little girl, others, my dear child. And suddenly the nun began to read aloud, to read over to the dead woman her whole history, all her tender memories. The judge, resting his elbow on the bed, was listening with his eyes fastened on his mother. The motionless body seemed happy. Sister Eulalie, interrupting herself, said suddenly, These ought to be put in the grave with her. They ought to be used as a shroud and she ought to be buried in it. She took another package, on which no name was written. She began to read in a firm voice. My adored one, I love you wildly. Since yesterday I have been suffering the tortures of the damned haunted by our memory. I feel your lips against mine, your eyes in mine, your breast against mine. I love you, I love you. You have driven me mad. My arms open, I gasp, moved by a wild desire to hold you again. My whole soul and body cries out for you, wants you. I have kept in my mouth the taste of your kisses. The judge had straightened himself up. The nun stopped reading. He snatched the letter from her and looked for the signature. There was none, but only under the words, the man who adores you, the name Henry. Their father's name was René. Therefore, this was not from him. The son then quickly rummaged through the package of letters, took one out, and read, I can no longer live without your caresses. Standing erect, severe as when sitting on the bench, he looked unmoved at the dead woman. The nun, straight as a statue, tears trembling in the corners of her eyes, was watching her brother, waiting. Then he crossed the room slowly, went to the window and stood there, gazing out into the dark night. When he turned around again, Sister Eulalie, her eyes dry now, was still standing near the bed, her head bent down. He stepped forward, quickly picked up the letters, and threw them pell-mell back into the drawer. Then he closed the curtains of the bed. When daylight made the candles on the table turn pale, the son slowly left his armchair, and without looking again at the mother upon whom he had passed sentence, severing the tie that united her to son and daughter, he said slowly, Let us now retire, sister. End of section 163. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 164 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 164. A Humble Drama. Meetings that are unexpected constitute the charm of traveling. Who has not experienced the joy of suddenly coming across a Parisian, a college friend, or a neighbor 500 miles from home? Who has not passed a night awake in one of those small, rattling country stagecoaches, in regions where steam is still a thing unknown, beside a strange young woman of whom one has only caught a glimpse in the dim light of the lantern as she entered the carriage in front of a white house in some small country town? And the next morning, when one's head and ears feel numb with the continuous tinkling of the bells and the loud rattling of the windows, what a charming sensation it is to see your pretty neighbor open her eyes, startled, glance around her, arrange her rebellious hair with her slender fingers, adjust her hat, feel with sure hand whether her corset is still in place, her waist straight, and her skirt not too wrinkled. She glances at you coldly and curiously. Then she leans back and no longer seems interested in anything but the country. In spite of yourself, you watch her, and in spite of yourself, you keep on thinking of her. Who is she? Whence does she come? Where is she going? In spite of yourself, you spin a little romance around her. She is pretty, she seems charming. Happy he who... Life might be delightful with her, who knows? She is perhaps the woman of our dreams, the one suited to our disposition, the one for whom our heart calls. And how delicious even the disappointment at seeing her get out at the gate of a country house. A man stands there who is awaiting her with two children and two maids. He takes her in his arms and kisses her as he lifts her out. Then she stoops over the little ones who hold up their hands to her. She kisses them tenderly, and then they all go away together down a path. Then she stoops over the little ones, who hold up their hands to her. She kisses them tenderly, and then they all go away together down a path, while the maids catch the packages which the driver throws down to them from the coach. 
Adieu, it is all over. You will never see her again. Adieu to the young woman who has passed the night by your side. You know her no more. You have not spoken to her. All the same, you feel a little sad to see her go. Adieu. I have had many of these souvenirs of travel, some joyful and some sad. Once I was in Auvergne, tramping through these delightful French mountains that are not too high, not too steep, but friendly and familiar. I had climbed the Sun Sea and entered a little inn near a pilgrim's chapel called Notre Dame de Vassivière, when I saw a queer, ridiculous-looking old woman breakfasting alone at the end table. She was at least seventy years old, tall, skinny, and angular, and her white hair was puffed around her temples in the old-fashioned style. She was dressed like a traveling Englishwoman, in awkward queer clothing, like a person who is indifferent to dress. She was eating an omelet and drinking water. Her face was peculiar, with restless eyes and the expression of one with whom fate has dealt unkindly. I watched her in spite of myself, thinking, who is she? What is the life of this woman? Why is she wandering alone through these mountains? She paid and rose to leave, drawing up over her shoulders an astonishing little shawl, the two ends of which hung over her arms. From a corner of the room she took an alpenstock, which was covered with names, traced with a hot iron. Then she went out, straight, erect, with the long steps of a letter carrier who was setting out on his route. A guide was waiting for her at the door, and both went away. I watched them go down the valley, along the road marked by a line of high wooden crosses. She was taller than her companion and seemed to walk faster than he. Two hours later I was climbing the edge of the deep funnel that encloses Lake Pavan in a marvelous and enormous basin of verdure, full of trees, bushes, rocks, and flowers. This lake is so round that it seems as if the outline had been drawn with a pair of compasses, so clear and blue that one might deem it a flood of azure come down from the sky, so charming that one would like to live in a hut on the wooded slope which dominates the crater, where the cold still water is sleeping. The Englishwoman was standing there like a statue, gazing down upon the transparent sheet in the dead volcano. She was straining her eyes to penetrate below the surface down to the unknown depths, where monstrous trout which have devoured all the other fish are said to live. As I was passing close by her, it seemed to me that two big tears were brimming in her eyes. But she departed at a great pace to rejoin her guide, who had stayed behind in an inn at the foot of the path leading to the lake. I did not see her again that day. The next day at nightfall I came to the Chateau of Miral. The old fortress, an enormous tower standing on a peak in the midst of a large valley, where three valleys intersect, rears its brown, uneven, cracked surface into the sky. It is round, from its large circular base to the crumbling turrets on its pinnacles. It astonishes the eye more than any other ruin by its simple mass, its majesty, its grave and imposing air of antiquity. It stands there alone, high as a mountain, a dead queen, but still the queen of the valley stretched out beneath it. You go up by a slope planted with firs, then you enter a narrow gate and stop at the foot of the walls, in the first enclosure, in full view of the entire country. Inside there are ruined halls, crumbling stairways, unknown cavities, dungeons, walls cut through in the middle, vaulted roofs held up one knows not how, and a mass of stones and crevices overgrown with grass where animals glide in and out. I was exploring this ruin alone. Suddenly I perceived behind a bit of wall a being, a kind of phantom, like a spirit of this ancient and crumbling habitation. I was taken aback with surprise, almost with fear, when I recognized the old lady whom I had seen twice. She was weeping with big tears in her eyes and held her handkerchief in her hand. I turned around to go away when she spoke to me, apparently ashamed to have been surprised in her grief. Yes, monsieur, I am crying. That does not happen often to me. Pardon me, madame, for having disturbed you, I stammered, confused, not knowing what to say. Some misfortune has doubtless come to you. Yes, no, I am like a lost dog, she murmured, and began to sob with her handkerchief over her eyes. Moved by these contagious tears, I took her hand, trying to calm her. Then, brusquely, she told me her history, as if no longer able to bear her grief alone. Oh, oh, monsieur, if you knew the sorrow in which I live, in what sorrow. Once I was happy. I have a house down there, a home. I cannot go back to it any more. I shall never go back to it again. It is too hard to bear. I have a son. It is he. It is he. Children don't know. Oh, one has such a short time to live. If I should see him now, I should perhaps not recognize him. How I loved him? How I loved him! Even before he was born, when I felt him move, and after that, how I have kissed and caressed and cherished him. If you knew how many nights I have passed in watching him sleep, and how many in thinking of him, I was crazy about him. When he was eight years old, his father sent him to boarding school. That was the end. He no longer belonged to me. Oh, heavens, he came to see me every Sunday. That was all. He went to college in Paris. Then he came only four times a year, and every time I was astonished to see how he had changed, to find him taller without having seen him grow. They stole his childhood from me, his confidence, and his love which otherwise would not have gone away from me. 
They stole my joy in seeing him grow, in seeing him become a man. I saw him four times a year, think of it, and at every one of his visits his body, his eye, his movements, his voice, his laugh were no longer the same, were no longer mine. All these things change so quickly in a child, and it is so sad if one is not there to see them change. One no longer recognizes him. One year, he came with down on his cheek. He, my son! I was dumbfounded, would you believe it? I hardly dared to kiss him. Was it really he, my little, little curly head of old, my dear, dear child, whom I had held in his diapers on my knee, and who had nursed at my breast with his little greedy lips? Was it he, this tall brown boy who no longer knew how to kiss me? who seemed to love me as a matter of duty, who called me mother for the sake of politeness, and who kissed me on the forehead when I felt like crushing him in my arms? My husband died, then my parents, then my two sisters. When death enters a house, it seems as if he were hurrying to do his utmost, so as not to have to return for a long time after that. He spares only one or two to mourn the others. I remained all alone. My tall son was then studying law. I was hoping to live and die near him, and I went to him so that we could live together. But he had fallen into the ways of young men, and he gave me to understand that I was in his way. So I left. I was wrong in doing so, but I suffered too much in feeling myself in his way, I, his mother, and I came back alone. I hardly ever saw him again. He married. What a joy! At last we should be together for good. I should have grandchildren. His wife was an Englishwoman who took a dislike to me. Why? Perhaps she thought that I loved him too much. Again I was obliged to go away, and I was alone. Yes, monsieur. Then he went to England to live with them, with his wife's parents. Do you understand? They have him. They have my son for themselves. They have stolen him from me. He writes to me once a month. At first he came to see me, but now he no longer comes. It is now four years since I saw him last. His face was wrinkled and his hair white. Was that possible? This man, my son, almost an old man? My little rosy child of old? No doubt I shall never see him again. And so I travel about all the year. I go east and west, as you see, with no companion. I am like a lost dog. Adieu, monsieur. Don't stay here with me, for it hurts me to have told you all this. I went down the hill, and on turning round to glance back, I saw the old woman standing on a broken wall, looking out upon the mountains, the long valley and Lake Chambon in the distance, and her skirt and the queer little shawl which she wore around her thin shoulders were fluttering like a flag in the wind. End of section 164. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 165 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 165. Mademoiselle Cocotte. We were just leaving the asylum when I saw a tall, thin man in a corner of the court who kept calling an imaginary dog. He was crying in a soft, tender voice, Cocotte, come here, Cocotte, my beauty, and slapping his thigh as one does when calling an animal. I asked the physician, Who is that man? He answered, Oh, he is not at all interesting. He is a coachman named Francois who became insane after drowning his dog. I insisted, Tell me his story. The most simple and humble things are sometimes those which touch our hearts most deeply. Here is this man's adventure, which was obtained from a friend of his, a groom. There was a family of rich bourgeois who lived in a suburb of Paris. They had a villa in the middle of a park at the edge of the Seine. Their coachman was this Francois, a country fellow, somewhat dull, kind-hearted, simple, and easy to deceive. One evening, as he was returning home, a dog began to follow him. At first he paid no attention to it, but the creature's obstinacy at last made him turn round. He looked to see if he knew this dog. No, he had never seen it. It was a female dog and frightfully thin. She was trotting behind him with a mournful and famished look, her tail between her legs, her ears flattened against her head, and stopping and starting whenever he did. He tried to chase the skeleton away and cried, Run along! Get out! Kss, kss. She retreated a few steps, then sat down and waited, and when the coachman started to walk again, she followed along behind him. He pretended to pick up some stones. The animal ran a little further away, but came back as soon as the man's back was turned. Then the coachman, Francois, took pity on the beast and called her. The dog approached timidly. The man patted her protruding ribs, moved by the beast's misery, and he cried, Come, come here. Immediately she began to wag her tail, and feeling herself taken in, adopted, she began to run along ahead of her new master. He made her a bed on the straw in the stable, then he ran to the kitchen for some bread. When she had eaten all she could, she curled up and went to sleep. When his employers heard of this, the next day, they allowed the coachman to keep the animal. It was a good beast, caressing and faithful, intelligent and gentle. Nevertheless, Francois adored Cocotte, and he kept repeating, 
That beast is human. She only lacks speech. He had a magnificent red leather collar made for her, which bore these words engraved on a copper plate. Mademoiselle Cocotte, belonging to the coachman Francois. She was remarkably prolific, and four times a year would give birth to a little batch of animals belonging to every variety of the canine race. Francois would pick out one which he would leave her, and he would unmercifully throw the others into the river. But soon the cook joined her complaints to those of the gardener. She would find dogs under the stove, in the ice box, in the coal bin, and they would steal everything they came across. Finally, the master, tired of complaints, impatiently ordered Francois to get rid of Cocotte. In despair, the man tried to give her away. Nobody wanted her. Then he decided to lose her, and he gave her to a teamster, who was to drop her on the other side of Paris, near joinville le pote Cocotte returned the same day. Some decision had to be taken. Five francs was given to a train conductor to take her to Havre. He was to drop her there. Three days later, she returned to the stable, thin, footsore, and tired out. The master took pity on her and let her stay, but other dogs were attracted as before, and one evening, when a big dinner party was on, a stuffed turkey was carried away by one of them right under the cook's nose, and she did not dare to stop him. This time the master completely lost his temper, and said angrily to Francois, "'If you don't throw this beast into the water before tomorrow morning, I'll put you out, do you hear?' The man was dumbfounded, and he returned to his room to pack his trunk, preferring to leave the place. Then he bethought himself that he could find no other situation as long as he dragged this animal about with him. He thought of his good position, where he was well paid and well fed, and he decided that a dog was really not worth all that. At last, he decided to rid himself of Cocotte at daybreak. He slept badly. He rose at dawn, and taking a strong rope, went out to get the dog. She stood up slowly, shook herself, stretched, and came to welcome her master. Then his courage forsook him, and he began to pet her affectionately, stroking her long ears, kissing her muzzle, and calling her tender names. But a neighboring clock struck six. He could no longer hesitate. He opened the door, calling, Come! The beast wagged her tail, understanding that she was to be taken out. They reached the beach, and he chose a place where the water seemed deep. Then he knotted the rope round the leather collar and tied a heavy stone to the other end. He seized Cocotte in his arms and kissed her madly, as though he were taking leave of some human being. He held her to his breast, rocked her, and called her, My dear little Cocotte, my sweet little Cocotte, and she grunted with pleasure. Ten times he tried to throw her into the water, and each time he lost courage. But suddenly he made up his mind and threw her as far from him as he could. At first she tried to swim, as she did when he gave her a bath, but her head, dragged down by the stone, kept going under, and she looked at her master with wild human glances as she struggled like a drowning person. Then the front part of her body sank, while her hind legs waved wildly out of the water. Finally, those also disappeared. Then, for five minutes, bubbles rose to the surface as though the river were boiling, and Francois, haggard, his heart beating, thought that he saw Cocotte struggling in the mud, and with the simplicity of a peasant he kept saying to himself, what does the poor beast think of me now? He almost lost his mind. He was ill for a month, and every night he dreamed of his dog. He could feel her licking his hands and hear her barking. It was necessary to call in a physician. At last he recovered, and toward the 2nd of June his employers took him to their estate at Bissard, near Rouen. There again he was near the Seine. He began to take baths. Every morning he would go down with the groom, and they would swim across the river. One day, as they were disporting themselves in the water, Francois suddenly cried to his companion, Look what's coming! I'm going to give you a chop! It was an enormous swollen corpse that was floating down with its feet sticking straight up in the air. Francois swam up to it, still joking. Woo! It's not fresh! What a catch, old man! It isn't thin, either! He kept swimming about at a distance from the animal that was in a state of decomposition. Then, suddenly, he was silent and looked at it. This time, he came near enough to touch it. He looked fixedly at the collar, and when he stretched out his arm, seized the neck, swung the corpse round and drew it up close to him, and read on the copper which had turned green and which still stuck to the discolored leather, Mademoiselle Cocotte belonging to the coachman Francois. The dead dog had come more than a hundred miles to find its master. He let out a frightful shriek and began to swim for the beach with all his might, still howling, and as soon as he touched land he ran away wildly, stark naked through the country. He was insane. End of section 165, recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 166 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 166, The Corsican Bandit. The road ascended gently through the forest of Eton. The large pines formed a solemn dome above our heads, and that mysterious sound made by the wind in the trees sounded like the notes of an organ. 
After walking for three hours, there was a clearing, and then at intervals an enormous pine umbrella, and then we suddenly came to the edge of the forest, some hundred meters below, the pass leading to the wild valley of Niolo. On the two projecting heights which commanded a view of this pass, some old trees, grotesquely twisted, seemed to have mounted with painful efforts, like scouts sent in advance of the multitude in the rear. When we turned round, we saw the entire forest stretch beneath our feet, like a gigantic basin of verdure, enclosed by bare rocks whose summit seemed to reach the sky. We resumed our walk, and ten minutes later found ourselves in the past. There I beheld a remarkable landscape. Beyond another forest stretched a valley, but such a valley as I had never seen before. A solitude of stone, ten leagues long, hollowed out between two high mountains, without a field or tree to be seen. This was the Niolo Valley, the fatherland of Corsican liberty, the inaccessible citadel from which the invaders had never been able to drive out the mountaineers. My companion said to me, This is where all our bandits have taken refuge? Ere long we were at the further end of this gorge, so wild, so inconceivably beautiful. Not a blade of grass, not a plant, nothing but granite. As far as our eyes could reach, we saw in front of us a desert of glittering stone, heated like an oven by a burning sun, which seemed to hang for that very purpose right above the gorge. When we raised our eyes toward the crests, we stood dazzled and stupefied by what we saw. They looked like a festoon of coral. All the summits are of porphyry, and the sky overhead was violet, purple, tinged with the coloring of these strange mountains. Lower down, the granite was of scintillating gray, and seemed ground to powder beneath our feet. At our right, along a long and irregular course, roared by a tumultuous torrent, and we staggered along under this heat in this light, in this burning, arid, desolate valley cut by this torrent of turbulent water, which seemed to be ever hurrying onward, without fertilizing the rocks, lost in this furnace which greedily drank it up without being saturated or refreshed by it. But suddenly there was visible at our right a little wooden cross sunk in a heap of stones. A man had been killed there, and I said to my companion, "'Tell me about your bandits.' He replied, I knew the most celebrated of them, the terrible St. Lucia. I will tell you his history. His father was killed in a quarrel by a young man of the district, it is said, and St. Lucia was left alone with his sister. He was a weak, timid youth, small, often ill, without any energy. He did not proclaim vengeance against the assassin of his father. All his relatives came to see him and implored of him to avenge his death. He remained deaf to their menaces and their supplications. Then, following the Corsican custom, his sister, in her indignation, carried away his black clothes, in order that he might not wear mourning for a dead man who had not been avenged. He was insensible to even this affront, and rather than take down from the rack his father's gun, which was still loaded, he shut himself up, not daring to brave the looks of the young men of the district. He seemed to have even forgotten the crime, and lived with his sister in the seclusion of their dwelling. But one day the man who was suspected of having committed the murder was about to get married. St. Lucia did not appear to be moved by this news but out of sheer bravado, doubtless. The bridegroom, on his way to the church, passed before the house of the two orphans. The brother and the sister, at their window, were eating frijoles, when the young man saw the bridal procession going by. Suddenly he began to tremble, rose to his feet without uttering a word, made the sign of the cross, took the gun which was hanging over the fireplace, and went out. When he spoke of this later on, he said, I don't know what was the matter with me, it was like fire in my blood. I felt that I must do it, that in spite of everything I could not resist, and I concealed the gun in a cave on the road to court. An hour later he came back, with nothing in his hand, and with his habitual air of sad weariness. His sister believed that there was nothing further in his thoughts, but when night fell, he disappeared. His enemy had, the same evening, to repair to court on foot, accompanied by his two groomsmen. He was walking along, singing as he went, when St. Lucia stood before him, and looking straight in the murderer's face, exclaimed, now is the time, and shot him point-blank in the chest. One of the men fled, the other stared at the young man, saying, What have you done, St. Lucia? And as he was about to hasten to court for help, when St. Lucia said in a stern tone, If you move another step, I'll shoot you in the leg. The other, aware of his timidity hitherto, replied, You would not dare to do it, and was hurrying off when he fell instantaneously, his thigh shattered by a bullet. And St. Lucia, coming over to where he lay, said, I am going to look at your wound. If it is not serious, I'll leave you there. If it is mortal, I'll finish you off. He inspected the wound, considered it mortal, and slowly reloading his gun, told the wounded man to say a prayer, and then shot him through the head. Next day he was in the mountains. And do you know what this St. Lucia did after this? All his family were arrested by the gendarmes. His uncle, the curé, who was suspected of having incited him to this deed of vengeance, was himself put in prison, and accused by the dead man's relatives. 
but he escaped, took a gun in his turn, and went to join his nephew in the brush. Next, St. Lucia killed one after another, his uncle's accusers, and tore out their eyes to teach the others never to state what they had seen with their eyes. He killed all the relatives, all the connections of his enemy's family. He slew during his life fourteen gendarmes, burned down the houses of his adversaries, and was, up to the day of his death, the most terrible of all the bandits whose memory we have preserved. The sun disappeared behind Monte Cinto, and the tall shadow of the granite mountain went to sleep on the granite of the valley. We quickened our pace in order to reach before night the little village of Albertaccio, nothing but a pile of stones welded into the flanks of a stone gorge. And I said as I thought of the bandit, What a terrible custom your vendetta is! My companion answered with an air of resignation, What would you have? A man must do his duty. End of section 166. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 167 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 167. The Grave. The 17th of July, 1883, at half past two in the morning, the watchman in the cemetery of Bezier, who lived in a small cottage on the edge of this field of the dead, was awakened by the barking of his dog, which was shut up in the kitchen. Going down quickly, he saw the animal sniffing at the crack of the door and barking furiously, as if some tramp had been sneaking about the house. The keeper, Vincent, therefore took his gun and went out. His dog, preceding him, at once ran in the direction of the Avenue General Bonnet, stopping short at the monument of Madame Tomasuo. The keeper, advancing cautiously, soon saw a faint light in the side of the Avenue Malinvert, and stealing in among the graves, he came upon a horrible act of profanation. A man had dug up the coffin of a young woman who had been buried the evening before, and was dragging the corpse out of it. A small dark lantern, standing on a pile of earth, lighted up this hideous scene. Vincent sprang upon the wretch, threw him to the ground, bound his hands, and took him to the police station. It was a young, wealthy, and respected lawyer in town named Corbataya. He was brought into court. The public prosecutor opened the case by referring to the monstrous deeds of the Sergeant Bertrand. A wave of indignation swept over the courtroom. When the magistrate sat down, the crowd assembled cried, Death! Death! With difficulty, the presiding judge established silence. Then he said gravely, Defendant, what have you to say in your defense? Corbataya, who had refused counsel, rose. He was a handsome fellow, tall, brown, with a frank face, energetic manner, and a fearless eye. Paying no attention to the whistlings in the room, he began to speak in a voice that was low and veiled at first, but that grew more firm as he proceeded. Monsieur le Président, gentlemen of the jury, I have very little to say. The woman whose grave I violated was my sweetheart. I loved her. I loved her not with a sensual love, and not with a mere tenderness of heart and soul, but with an absolute, complete love, and an overpowering passion. Hear me. When I met her for the first time, I felt a strange sensation. It was not astonishment nor admiration, nor yet that which is called love at first sight, but a feeling of delicious well-being, as if I had been plunged into a warm bath. Her gestures seduced me, her voice enchanted me, and it was with infinite pleasure that I looked upon her person. It seemed to me as if I had seen her before, and as if I had known her a long time. She had within her something of my spirit. She seemed to me like an answer to a cry uttered by my soul, to that vague, unceasing cry which we call upon hope for our whole life. When I knew her a little better, the mere thought of seeing her again filled me with an exquisite and profound uneasiness. The touch of her hand in mine was more delightful to me than anything that I had imagined. Her smile filled me with mad joy, with a desire to run, to dance, to fling myself upon the ground. So we became lovers. Yes, more than that, she was my very life. I looked for nothing further on earth and had no further desires. I longed for nothing further. One evening, when we had gone on a somewhat long walk by the river, we were overtaken by the rain and she caught cold. It developed into pneumonia the next day and a week later, she was dead. During the hours of her suffering, astonishment and consternation prevented my understanding and reflecting upon it. But when she was dead, I was so overwhelmed by blank despair that I had no thoughts left. I wept. During all the horrible details of the internment, my keen and wild grief was like a madness, a kind of sensual, physical grief. Then when she was gone, when she was under the earth, my mind at once found itself again, and I passed through a series of moral sufferings so terrible that even the love she had vouchsafed to me was dear at that price. Then the fixed idea came to me. I shall not see her again. When one dwells on this thought for a whole day, one feels as if you were going mad. Just think of it. There was a woman whom you adore, a unique woman, for in the whole universe there is not a second one like her. 
This woman has given herself to you, and created with you the mysterious union that is called love. Her eye seems to you more vast than space, more charming than the world, that clear eye smiling with her tenderness. This woman loves you. When she speaks to you, her voice floods you with joy. And suddenly she disappears. Think of it. She disappears, not only for you, but forever. She is dead. Do you understand what that means? Never, 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 not anywhere will she exist any more. Never more will that eye look upon anything again. Never more will that voice, nor any voice like it, utter a word in the same way as she uttered it. Never more will a face be born that is like hers. Never. Never. The molds of statues are kept, casts are kept by which one can make objects with the same outlines and forms, but that one body and that one face will never more be born again upon the earth. And yet millions and millions of creatures will be born, and more than that, and this one woman will not reappear among all the women of the future. Is it possible? It drives one mad to think of it. She lived for twenty years, not more, and she has disappeared forever, forever, forever. She thought, she smiled, she loved me, and now nothing. The flies that die in the autumn are as much as we are in this world, and now nothing. And I thought that her body, her fresh body, so warm, so sweet, so white, so lovely, would rot down there in that box under the earth. And her soul, her thought, her love, where is it? Not to see her again? The idea of this decomposing body that I might yet recognize haunted me. I wanted to look at it once more. I went out with a spade, a lantern, and a hammer. I jumped over the cemetery wall and I found the grave, which had not yet been closed entirely. I uncovered the coffin and took up a board. An abominable odor, the stench of putrefaction, greeted my nostrils. Yet I opened the coffin, and, holding my lighted lantern down into it, I saw her. Her face was blue, swollen, and frightful. A black liquid had oozed out of her mouth. She! That was she! Horror seized me, but I stretched out my arm to draw this monstrous face toward me, and then I was caught. All night I have retained the foul odor of this putrid body, the odor of my well-beloved, as one retains the perfume of a woman after a love embrace. Do with me what you will. A strange silence seemed to oppress the room. They seemed to be waiting for something more. The jury retired to deliberate. When they came back a few minutes later, the accused showed no fear and did not even seem to think. The president announced with the normal formalities that his judges had declared him to be not guilty. He did not move, and the room applauded. End of section 167. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 168 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 168. Old Judas. The entire stretch of country was amazing. It was characterized by grandeur that was almost religious, and yet it had an air of sinister desolation. A great wild lake, filled with stagnant black water, in which thousands of reeds were waving to and fro, lay in the midst of a vast circle of naked hills, where nothing grew but broom, or here and there an oak curiously twisted by the wind. Just one house stood on the banks of that dark lake, a small, low house, inhabited by Uncle Joseph, an old boatman, who lived on what he could make by his fishing. Once a week he carried the fish he caught into the surrounding villages, returning with the few provisions that he needed for his sustenance. I went to see this old hermit, who offered to take me with him to his nets, and I accepted. His boat was old, worm-eaten, and clumsy, and the skinny old man rowed with a gentle and monotonous stroke that was soothing to the soul, already oppressed by the sadness of the land round about. It seemed to me as if I were transported to olden times, in the midst of that ancient country, in that primitive boat, which was propelled by a man of another age. He took up his nets and threw the fish into the bottom of the boat, as the fishermen of the Bible might have done. Then he took me down to the end of the lake, where I suddenly perceived a ruin on the other side of the bank, a dilapidated hut with an enormous red cross on the wall, that looked as if it might have been traced with blood, as it gleamed in the last rays of the setting sun. "'What is that?' I asked. "'That is where Judas died,' the man replied, crossing himself. I was not surprised, being almost prepared for this strange answer. Still I asked, "'Judas? What Judas?' wandering Jew, monsieur, he added. I asked him to tell me this legend, but it was better than a legend, being a true story and quite a recent one, since Uncle Joseph had known the man. This hut had formerly been occupied by a large woman, a kind of beggar who lived on public charity. Uncle Joseph did not remember from whom she had this hut. One evening, an old man with a white beard, who seemed to be at least two hundred years old, and who could hardly drag himself along, asked alms of this forlorn woman as he passed her dwelling. "'Sit down, father,' she replied. "'Everything here belongs to all the world, since it comes from all the world.' He sat down on a stone before the door. 
He shared the woman's bread, her bed of leaves, and her house. He did not leave her again, for he had come to the end of his travels. It was Our Lady the Virgin who permitted this, monsieur, Joseph added, it being a woman who had opened her door to Judas, for this old vagabond was a wandering Jew. It was not known at first in the country, but the people suspected it very soon because he was always walking. It had become a sort of second nature to him. And suspicion had been aroused by still another thing. This woman, who kept that stranger with her, was thought to be a Jewess, for no one had ever seen her at church. For ten miles around, no one called her anything else but the Jewess. When the little country children saw her come to beg, they cried out, "'Mama, Mama, here is the Jewess!' The old man and she began to go out together into the neighboring districts, holding out their hands at all the doors, stammering supplications into the ears of all the passers. They could be seen at all hours of the day, on bypaths, in the villages, or again eating bread, sitting in the noon heat under the shadow of some solitary tree, and the country people began to call the beggar Old Judas. One day he brought home in his sack two little live pigs, which a farmer had given him after he had cured the farmer of some sickness. Soon he stopped begging and devoted himself entirely to his pigs. He took them out to feed by the lake or under isolated oaks or in the nearby valleys. The woman, however, went about all day begging, but she always came back to him in the evening. He also did not go to church, and no one had ever seen him cross himself before the wayside crucifixes. All this gave rise to much gossip. One night his companion was attacked by a fever and began to tremble like a leaf in the wind. He went to the nearest town to get some medicine, and then he shut himself up with her and was not seen for six days. The priest, having heard that the Jewess was about to die, came to offer the consolation of his religion and administer the last sacrament. Was she a Jewess? He did not know. But in any case, he wished to try to save her soul. Hardly had he knocked at the door when old Judas appeared on the threshold, breathing hard, his eyes aflame, his long beard agitated like rippling water, and he hurled blasphemies in an unknown language, extending his skinny arms in order to prevent the priest from entering. The priest attempted to speak, offered his purse and his aid, but the old man kept on abusing him, making gestures with his hands as if throwing stones at him. Then the priest retired, followed by the curses of the beggar. The companion of old Judas died on the following day. He buried her himself in front of her door. They were people of so little account that no one took any interest in them. Then they saw the man take his pigs out again to the lake and up the hillsides, and he also began begging again to get food, but the people gave him hardly anything, as there was so much gossip about him. Everyone knew, moreover, how he had treated the priest. Then he disappeared. That was during Holy Week, but no one paid any attention to him. But on Easter Sunday, the boys and girls who had gone walking out to the lake heard a great noise in the hut. The door was locked, but the boys broke it in, and the two pigs ran out, jumping like gnats. No one ever saw them again. The whole crowd went in. They saw some old rags on the floor, the beggar's hat, some bones, clots of dried blood and bits of flesh in the hollows of the skull. His pigs had devoured him. This happened on Good Friday, monsieur, Joseph concluded his story, three hours after noon. How do you know that? I asked him. There is no doubt about that, he replied. I did not attempt to make him understand that it could easily happen that the famished animals had eaten their master after he had died suddenly in his hut. As for the cross on the wall, it had appeared one morning, and no one knew what hand had traced it in that strange color. Since then no one doubted any longer that the wandering Jew had died on the spot. I myself believed it for one hour. End of section 168. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 169 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 169. The Little Cask. He was a tall man of forty or thereabout, this Jules Chicot, the innkeeper of Spreville, with a red face and a round stomach, and said by those who knew him to be a smart businessman. He had stopped his buggy in front of Mother Magloire's farmhouse, and, hitching the horse to the gatepost, went in at the gate. Chicot owned some land adjoining that of the old woman, which she had been coveting for a long while, and had tried in vain to buy a score of times, but she had always obstinately refused to part with it. "'I was born here, and here I mean to die,' was all she said. He found her peeling potatoes outside the farmhouse door. She was a woman of about seventy-two, very thin, shriveled and wrinkled, almost dried up, in fact, and bent, but as active and untiring as a girl. Chicot patted her on the back in a friendly fashion, and then sat down by her on a stool. "'Well, mother, you are always pretty well and hearty, I am glad to see.' "'Nothing to complain of, considering, thank you. And how are you, Monsieur Chicot?' "'Oh, pretty well, thank you, except a few rheumatic pains occasionally. Otherwise I have nothing to complain of. So much the better.' 
and she said no more while she co-watched her going on with her work. Her crooked, knotted fingers, hard as a lobster's claws, seized the tubers, which were lying in a pail, as if they had been a pair of pinchers, and she peeled them rapidly, cutting off long strips of skin with an old knife which she held in the other hand, throwing the potatoes into the water as they were done. Three daring fowls jumped one after the other into her lap, seized a bit of peel, and then ran away as fast as their legs would carry them with it in their beak. Chicot seemed embarrassed, anxious, with something on the tip of his tongue which he could not say. At last he said hurriedly, "'Listen, Mother Magloire. "'Well, what is it? "'You are quite sure that you do not want to sell your land? "'Certainly not. "'You may make up your mind about that. "'What have I said? "'I have said. "'So don't refer to it again. "'Very well. "'Only I think I know of an arrangement "'that might suit us both very well. "'What is it? "'Just this. "'You shall sell it to me and keep it all the same. "'You don't understand? "'Very well. "'Then follow me in what I am going to say.' The old woman left off peeling potatoes and looked at the innkeeper attentively from under her heavy eyebrows, and he went on. Let me explain myself. Every month I will give you a hundred and fifty francs. You understand me. Suppose. Every month I will come and bring you thirty crowns, and it will not make the slightest difference in your life, not the very slightest. You will have your own home just as you have now, need not trouble yourself about me, and will owe me nothing. All you will have to do is take my money. Will that arrangement suit you? He looked at her good-humouredly, one might have almost said benevolently, and the old woman returned his looks distrustfully, as if she respected a trap, and said, "'It seems all right as far as I am concerned, but it will not give you the farm.' "'Never mind about that,' he said. "'You may remain here as long as it pleases God Almighty to let you live. It will be your home. Only you will sign a deed before a lawyer making it over to me after your death. You have no children, only nephews and nieces for whom you don't care a straw. Will that suit you?' You will keep everything during your life, and I will give you the thirty crowns a month. It is pure gain as far as you are concerned. The old woman was surprised, rather uneasy, but nevertheless very much tempted to agree, and answered, I don't say that I will not agree to it, but I must think about it. Come back in a week and we will talk it over again, and I will then give you my definite answer. And Chicot went off, as happy as a king who had conquered an empire. Mother Magloire was thoughtful, and did not sleep at all that night. In fact, for four days she was in a fever of hesitation. She suspected that there was something underneath the offer which was not to her advantage, but then the thought of thirty crowns a month, of all those coins clinking in her apron, falling to her, as it were, from the skies, without her doing anything for it, aroused her covetousness. She went to the notary and told him about it. He advised her to accept Chicot's offer, but said she ought to ask for an annuity of fifty instead of thirty, as her farm was worth sixty thousand francs at the lowest calculation. "'If you live for fifteen years longer,' he said, even then he will only have paid forty-five thousand francs for it. The old woman trembled with joy at this prospect of getting fifty crowns a month, but she was still suspicious, fearing some trick, and she remained a long time with the lawyer asking questions without being able to make up her mind to go. At last she gave him instructions to draw up the deed and returned home with her head in a whirl, just as if she had drunk four jugs of new cider. When Chicot came again to receive her answer, she declared, after a lot of persuading, that she could not make up her mind to agree to his proposal— though she was all the time trembling lest he should not consent to give the fifty crowns, but at last, when he grew urgent, she told him what she expected for her farm. He looked surprised and disappointed, and refused. Then, in order to convince him, she began to talk about the probable duration of her life. I am certainly not likely to live more than five or six years longer. I am nearly seventy-three, and far from strong, even considering my age. The other evening I thought I was going to die, and could hardly manage to crawl into bed. But Chicot was not going to be taken in. Come, come, old lady, you are as strong as a church tower, and will live till you are a hundred at least. You will no doubt see me put under the ground first. The whole day was spent in discussing the money, and as the old woman would not give in, the innkeeper consented to give the fifty crowns, and she insisted upon having ten crowns over and above to strike the bargain. Three years passed, and the old dame did not seem to have grown a day older. Chicot was in despair, and it seemed to him as if he had been paying that annuity for fifty years, that he had been taken in, done, ruined. From time to time he went to see the old lady, just as one goes in July to see when the harvest is likely to begin. She always met him with a cunning look, and one might have supposed that she was congratulating herself on the trick she had played him. Seeing how well and hearty she seemed, he soon got into his buggy again, growling to himself, "'Will you never die, you old hag?' He did not know what to do. He felt inclined to strangle her when he saw her. He hated her with a ferocious, cunning hatred, the hatred of a peasant who has been robbed, and began to cast about for some means of getting rid of her. One day he came to see her again, rubbing his hands as he did the first time he proposed the bargain. 
and after having chatted for a few minutes, he said, Why do you never come and have a bit of dinner at my place when you are in Spervia? The people are talking about it and saying we are not on friendly terms, and that pains me. You know it will cost you nothing if you come, for I don't look at the price of a dinner. Come whenever you feel inclined, I shall be very glad to see you. Old Mother Magloire did not need to be asked twice, and the next day but one, as she had to go to the town in any case, it being market day, she let her man drive her to Chicot's place, where the buggy was put in the barn while she went into the house to get her dinner. The innkeeper was delighted and treated her like a lady, giving her roast fowl, black pudding, leg of mutton, and bacon and cabbage, but she ate next to nothing. She had always been a small eater, and had generally lived on a little soup and crust of bread and butter. Chicot was disappointed and pressed her to eat more, but she refused, and she would drink little, and declined coffee, so he asked her, "'But surely you will take a little drop of brandy or liquor?' "'Well, as to that, I don't know that I will refuse.' Whereupon he shouted out, "'Rosalie, bring the superfine brandy, the special, you know.' The servant appeared, carrying a long bottle ornamented with a paper vine leaf, and he filled two liquor glasses. "'Just try that. You will find it first-rate.' The good woman drank it slowly in sips, so as to make the pleasure last all the longer, and when she had finished her glass, she said, "'Yes, that is first-rate.' Almost before she had said it, Chicot had poured her out another glassful. She wished to refuse, but it was too late, and she drank it very slowly, as she had done the first, and he asked her to have a third. She objected, but he persisted. "'It is as mild as milk, you know. I can drink ten or a dozen glasses without any ill effects. It goes down like sugar and does not go to the head. One would think that it evaporated on the tongue. It is the most wholesome thing you can drink.' She took it, for she really enjoyed it, but she left half the glass." Then Chicot, in an excess of generosity, said, "'Look here. As it is so much to your taste, I will give you a small keg of it, just to show that you and I are still excellent friends.' So she took one away with her, feeling slightly overcome by the effects of what she had drunk. The next day the innkeeper drove to her yard and took a little iron-hooped keg out of his gig. He insisted on her tasting the contents to make sure it was the same delicious article, and, when they had each of them drunk three more glasses, he said as he was going away, well, you know, when it is all gone, there is more left. Don't be modest, for I shall not mind. The sooner it is finished, the better pleased I shall be. Four days later, he came again. The old woman was outside her door, cutting up the bread for her soup. He went up to her and put his face close to hers so that he might smell her breath, and when he smelt the alcohol, he felt pleased. I suppose you will give me a glass of the special, he said, and they had three glasses each. Soon, however, it began to be whispered abroad that Mother Magloire was in the habit of getting drunk all by herself. She was picked up in her kitchen, then in her yard, then in the roads in the neighborhood, and she was often brought home like a log. The innkeeper did not go near her any more, and, when people spoke to him about her, he used to say, putting on a distressed look, "'It is a great pity that she should have taken to drink at her age, but when people get old there is no remedy. It will be the death of her in the long run.' And it certainly was the death of her. She died the next winter. About Christmas time she fell down, unconscious in the snow, and was found dead the next morning." And when Chicot came for the farm, he said, It was very stupid of her. If she had not taken to drink, she probably would have lived ten years longer. End of section 169. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 170 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 170. Boitel. Father Boitel, Antoine, made a specialty of undertaking dirty jobs all throughout the countryside. Whenever there was a ditch or a cesspool to be cleaned out, a dunghill removed, a sewer cleansed, or any dirt hole whatever, he was always employed to do it. He would come with the instruments of his trade, his sabots covered with dirt, and set to work, complaining incessantly about his occupation. When people asked him then why he did this loathsome work, he would reply resignedly, "'Faith, tis for my children whom I must support.' This brings me in more than anything else. He had, indeed, fourteen children. If anyone asked him what had become of them, he would say with an air of indifference, There are only eight of them left in the house. One is out at service, and five are married. When the questioner wanted to know whether they were well married, he replied vivaciously, I did not oppose them. I oppose them in nothing. They married just as they pleased. We shouldn't go against people's likings. It turns out badly. I am a night scavenger because my parents went against my likings. But for that, I would have to become a workman like the others. Here is the way his parents had thwarted him in his likings. He was at the time a soldier stationed at half, not more stupid than another, or sharper either, a rather simple fellow, however. When he was not on duty, his greatest pleasure was to walk along the quay where the bird dealers congregate. 
Sometimes alone, sometimes with a soldier from his own part of the country, he would slowly saunter along by cages containing parrots with green backs and yellow heads from the banks of the Amazon, or parrots with gray backs and red heads from Senegal, or enormous macaws, which looks like birds reared in hothouses, with their flower-like feathers, their plumes, and their tufts. Parrots of every size, who seem painted with minute care by the miniaturist, God Almighty, and the little birds, all the smaller birds hopped about, yellow, blue, and variegated, mingling their cries with the noise of the key, and adding to the din caused by unloading the vessels, as well as by passengers and vehicles, a violent clamor, loud, shrill, and deafening, as if from some distant forest of monsters. Boitel would pause with wandering eyes, wide open mouth, laughing and enraptured, showing his teeth to the captive cockatoos, who kept nodding their white or yellow topknots toward the glaring red of his breeches and the copper buckle of his belt. When he found a bird that could talk, he put questions to it, and if it happened at the time to be disposed to reply and to hold a conversation with him, he would carry away enough amusement to last him till evening. He also found heaps of amusement in looking at the monkeys, and could conceive no greater luxury for a rich man than to own these animals as one owns cats and dogs. This taste for the exotic he had in his blood, as people have a taste for chase, or for medicine, or for the priesthood. He could not help returning to the quay every time the gates of the barracks opened, drawn toward it by irresistible longing. On one occasion, having stopped almost in ecstasy before an enormous macaw, which was swelling out its plumes, bending forward and bridling up again, as if making the court curtsies of parrot land, he saw the door of a little café adjoining the bird dealer's shop open, and a young negress appeared, wearing on her head a red silk handkerchief. She was sweeping into the street the corks and sand of the establishment. Boitel's attention was soon divided between the bird and the woman, and he really could not tell which of these two beings he contemplated with greater astonishment and delight. The negress, having swept the rubbish into the street, raised her eyes, and in turn, was dazzled by the soldier's uniform. There she stood facing him with her broom in her hands as if she were bringing him a rifle, while the macaw continued bowing. But at the end of a few seconds the soldier began to feel embarrassed at this attention, and he walked away quietly so as not to look as if he were beating a retreat. But he came back. Almost every day he passed before the Café de Colonies, and often he could distinguish through the window the figure of the little black-skinned maid serving box or glasses of brandy to the soldiers of the port. Frequently, too, she would come out to the door on seeing him. Soon, without even having exchanged a word, they smiled at one another like acquaintances, and Boitel felt his heart touched when he suddenly saw, glittering between the dark lips of the girl, a shining row of white teeth. At length, one day he ventured to enter, and was quite surprised to find that she could speak French like everyone else. The bottle of lemonade, of which she was good enough to accept a glass full, remained in the soldier's recollection memorably delicious, and it became a custom with him to come and absorb in this little tavern on the quay all the agreeable drinks which he could afford. For him it was a treat, a happiness on which his thoughts dwelt constantly, to watch the black hand of the little maid pouring something into his glass while her teeth laughed more than her eyes. At the end of two months they became fast friends, and Boitel, after his first astonishment at discovering that this negress had as good principles as honest French girls, that she exhibited a regard for economy, industry, religion, and good conduct, loved her more on that account, and was so charmed with her that he wanted to marry her. He told her his intentions, which made her dance with joy. She had also a little money, left her by a female oyster dealer, who had picked her up when she had been left on the quay at half by an American captain. This captain had found her when she was only about six years old, lying on bales of cotton in the hold of his ship, some hours after his departure from New York. On his arrival in Havre, he abandoned to the care of this compassionate oyster dealer, the little black creature, who had been hidden on board his vessel. He knew not why or by whom. The oyster woman having died, the young negress became a servant at the colonial tavern. Antoine Boitel added, This will be all right if my parents don't oppose it. I will never go against them, you understand? Never. I'm going to say a word or two to them the first time I go back to the country. On the following week, in fact, having obtained 24 hours' leave, he went to see his family, who cultivated a little farm at Tortvilla near Yves He waited till the meal was finished, the hour when the coffee baptized with brandy makes people more open-hearted, before informing his parents that he had found a girl who satisfied his tastes, all his tastes, so completely that there could not exist any other being in all the world so perfectly suited to him. The old people, on hearing this, immediately assumed a cautious manner and wanted explanations, he had concealed nothing from them except the color of her skin. She was a servant without much means, but strong, thrifty, clean, well-conducted, and sensible. All these things were better than money would be in the hands of a bad housewife. Moreover, she had a few sous, left her by a woman who had reared her, a good number of sous, almost a little dowry, fifteen hundred francs in the savings bank. The old people, persuaded by his talk and relying on their old judgment, were gradually weakening when he came to the delicate point. 
laughing in a rather constrained fashion, he said, <laughs> There's only one thing you might not like. She is not a white slip. They did not understand, and he had to explain at some length and very cautiously to avoid shocking them that she belonged to the dusky race of which they had only seen samples in pictures at Epinal. Then they became restless, perplexed, alarmed, as if he had proposed a union with the devil. The mother said, Black? How much of her is black? Is the whole of her? He replied, Certainly, everywhere, just as you are white everywhere. The father interposed, Black? Is it as black as the pot? The son answered, Perhaps a little less than that. She is black, but not disgustingly black. The curé's cassock is black, but it's not any uglier than a surplice which is white. The father said, Are there more black people besides her in her country? And the son, with an air of conviction, exclaimed, Certainly. But the old man shook his head. That must be unpleasant. And the son, It isn't more disagreeable than anything else when you get used to it. The mother asked, it doesn't soil the underwear more than other skins, this black skin? Not more than your own, as it is her proper color. Then, after many other questions, it was agreed that the parents should see this girl before coming to any decision, and that the young fellow, whose term of military service would be over in a month, should bring her to the house in order that they might examine her, and decide by talking the matter over whether or not she was too dark to enter the Boitel family. Antoine accordingly announced that on Sunday, the 22nd of May, the day of his discharge, he would start for Tordvia with his sweetheart. She had put on, for this journey to the house of her lover's parents, her most beautiful and most gaudy clothes, in which yellow, red, and blue were the prevailing colors, so that she looked as if she were adorned for a national festival. At the terminus, as they were leaving half, people stared at her, and Boitel was proud of giving his arm to a person who commanded so much attention. Then, in the third-class carriage, in which she took a seat by his side, she aroused so much astonishment among the country folks that the people in the adjoining compartment stood up on their benches to look at her over the wooden partition which divides the compartments. A child, at the sight of her, began to cry with terror. Another concealed his face in his mother's apron. Everything went off well, however, up to their arrival at their destination. But when the train slackened its rate of motion as they drew near Yves Tote, Antoine felt ill at ease, as he would have done at a review when he did not know his drill practice. Then, as he leaned his head out, he recognized in the distance— his father holding the bridle of the horse harnessed to a carryall, and his mother, who had come forward to the grating, behind which stood those who were expecting friends. He alighted first, gave his hand to his sweetheart, and holding himself erect as if he were escorting a general, he went to meet his family. The mother, on seeing this black lady in variegated costume in her son's company, remained so stupefied that she could not open her mouth, and the father found it hard to hold the horse, which the engine or the negress caused to rear continuously. But Antoine, suddenly filled with unmixed joy at seeing once more the old people, rushed forward with open arms, embraced his mother, embraced his father, in spite of the nag's fright, and then, turning toward his companion, at whom the passengers on the platform stopped to stare with amazement, he proceeded to explain. Here she is. I told you that, at first sight, she is not attractive, but as soon as you know her, I can assure you there's not a better sort in the whole world. Say good morning to her, so that she may not feel badly." Thereupon, Mère Boitel, almost frightened out of her wits, made a sort of curtsy, while the father took off his cap, murmuring, I wish you good luck. Then, without further delay, they climbed into the carryall, the two women in the back, on the seats which made them jump up and down as the vehicle went jolting along the road, and the two men in front on the front seat. Nobody spoke. Antoine, ill at ease, whistled a barrack room air. His father whipped the nag, and his mother, from where she sat in the corner, kept casting sly glances at the negress, whose forehead and cheekbones shone in the sunlight like well-polished shoes. Wishing to break the ice, Antoine turned round. Well, said he, we don't seem inclined to talk. We must have time, replied the old woman. He went on. Come, tell us a little story about that hen of yours that laid eight eggs. It was a funny anecdote of long standing in the family. But, as his mother still remained silent, paralyzed by her emotion, he undertook himself to tell the story, laughing as he did so at the memorable incident. The father, who knew it by heart, brightened at the opening words of the narrative. His wife soon followed his example, and the negress herself, when he reached the drollest part of it, suddenly gave vent to such a laugh, a loud, rolling torrent of laughter, that the horse, becoming excited, broke into a gallop for a while. That served to cement their acquaintance. They all began to chat. They had scarcely reached the house and had all alighted when Antoine conducted his sweetheart to a room so that she might take off her dress to avoid staining it, as she was going to prepare a nice dish intended to win the old people's affections through their stomachs. He drew his parents outside the house and, with beating heart, asked, 
Well, what do you say now? The father said nothing. The mother, less timid, exclaimed, She is too black. No, indeed, this is too much for me. It turns my blood. You will get used to it, said Antoine. Perhaps so, but not at first. They went into the house, where the good woman was somewhat affected at the spectacle of the negress engaged in cooking. She at once proceeded to assist her, with petticoats tucked up, active in spite of her age. The meal was an excellent one, very long, very enjoyable. When they were taking a turn after dinner, Antoine took his father aside. Well, Dad, what do you say about it? The peasant took care never to compromise himself. I have no opinion about it. Ask your mother. So Antoine went back to his mother, and, detaining her behind the rest, said, Well, mother, what do you think of her? My poor lad, she is really too black. If she were only a little less black, I would not go against you, but this is too much. One would think it was Satan. He did not press her, knowing how obstinate the old woman had always been, but he felt a tempest of disappointment sweeping over his heart. He was turning over in his mind what he ought to do, what plan he could devise, surprised, moreover, that she had not conquered them already as she had captivated himself. And they, all four, walked along through the wheat fields, having gradually relapsed into silence. Whenever they passed a fence, they saw a countryman sitting on the stile, and a group of brats climbed up to stare at them, and everyone rushed out into the road to see the black whore young Boitel had brought home with him. At a distance, they noticed people scampering across the fields, just as when the drum beats to draw public attention to some living phenomenon. Père and Mère Boitel, alarmed at this curiosity, which was exhibited everywhere throughout the country at their approach, quickened their pace, walking side by side, and leaving their son far behind. His dark companion asked what his parents thought of her. He hesitatingly replied that they had not yet made up their minds. But on the village green, people rushed out of all the houses in a flutter of excitement, and, at the sight of the gathering crowd, old Boitel took to his heels and regained his abode, while Antoine, swelling with rage, his sweetheart on his arm, advanced majestically under the staring eyes, which opened wide in amazement. He understood that it was at an end and there was no hope for him, that he could not marry his negress. She also understood it, and as they drew near the farmhouse, they both began to weep. As soon as they had got back to the house, she once more took off her dress to aid the mother in the household duties, and followed her everywhere, to the dairy, to the stable, to the hen house, taking on herself the hardest part of the work, repeating always, Let me do it, Madame Boitel. So that when night came on, the old woman, touched but inexorable, said to her son, She is a good girl all the same. It's a pity she is so black, but indeed she is too black. I could not get used to it. She must go back again. She is too, too black. And young Boitel said to his sweetheart, She will not consent. She thinks you are too black. You must go back again. I will go with you to the train. No matter. Don't fret. I'm going to talk to them after you have started. He then took her to the railway station, still cheering her with hope, and when he kissed her, he put her into the train, and he watched as it passed out of sight, his eyes swollen with tears. In vain did he appeal to the old people. They would never give their consent. And when he had told the story, which was known all over the country, Antoine Botel would always add, From that time forward, I have had no heart for anything, for anything at all. No trade suited me any longer, and so I became what I am, a night scavenger. People would say to him, Yet you got married. Yes, and I can't say that my wife didn't please me, seeing that I have fourteen children. But she is not the other one. Oh no, certainly not. The other one, mark you, my negress, she had only to give me one glance, and I felt as if I were in heaven. End of section 170. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 171 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 171. A Widow. This story was told during the hunting season at the Chautou Banvia. The autumn had been rainy and sad. The red leaves, instead of rustling under the feet, were rotting under the heavy downfalls. The forest was as damp as it could be. From it came an odor of must, of rain, of soaked grass and wet earth and the sportsmen, their backs hunched under the downpour, mournful dogs with tails between their legs and hair sticking to their sides, and the young women with their clothes drenched returned every evening, tired in body and mind. After dinner in the large drawing room, everybody paid lotto without enjoyment, while the wind whistled madly around the house. Then they tried telling stories like those they read in books, but no one was able to invent anything amusing. The hunters told tales of wonderful shots and of the butchery of rabbits, and the women racked their brains for ideas without revealing the imagination of Scheherazade. They were about to give up this diversion when a young woman, who was idly caressing the hand of an old maiden aunt, noticed a little ring made of blonde hair, which she had often seen without paying any attention to it. She fingered it gently and asked, 
Auntie, what is this ring? It looks as if it were made from the hair of a child. The old lady blushed, grew pale, and then answered in a trembling voice. It is sad, so sad that I wish never to speak of it. All the unhappiness of my life comes from that. I was very young then, and the memory has remained so painful that I weep every time I think of it. Immediately everybody wished to know the story, but the old lady refused to tell it. Finally, after they had coaxed her for a long time, she yielded. Here is the story. You have often heard me speak of the Santez family, now extinct. I knew the last three members of this family. They all died in the same manner. This hair belongs to the last one. He was thirteen when he killed himself for me. That seems strange to you, doesn't it? Oh, it was a very strange family. Mad, if you will, but a charming madness, the madness of love. From father to son, all had violent passions which filled their whole being, which impelled them to do wild things, drove them to frantic enthusiasm, even to crime. This was born in them, just as burning devotion is in certain souls. Trappers have not the same nature as minions of the drawing room. There was a saying, as passionate as a santez. They could be noticed by looking at them. They all had the wavy hair falling over their brows, curly beards and large eyes whose glance pierced and moved one, though one could not say why. The grandfather of the owner of this hair, of whom it is the last souvenir, after many adventures, duels, and elopements, at about sixty-five, fell madly in love with his farmer's daughter. I knew them both. She was blonde, pale, distinguished-looking, with a slow manner of talking, a quiet voice, and a look so gentle that one might have taken her for a Madonna. The old nobleman took her to his home and was soon so captivated with her that he could not live without her for a minute. His daughter and daughter-in-law, who lived in the chateau, found this perfectly natural. Love was such a tradition in the family. Nothing in regard to a passion surprised them, and if one spoke before them of parted lovers, even of vengeance after treachery, both said in the same sad tone, Oh, how he must have suffered to come to that point. That was all. They grew sad over tragedies of love, but never indignant, even when they were criminal. Now one day a young man named Monsieur de Gradel, who had been invited for the shooting, eloped with the young girl. Monsieur de Santez remained calm as if nothing had happened, but one morning he was found hanging in the kennels among his dogs. His son died in the same manner in a hotel in Paris during a journey which he made there in 1841, after being deceived by a singer from the opera. He left a twelve-year-old child and a widow, my mother's sister. She came to my father's house with the boy while we were living at Bertillon. I was then seventeen. You have no idea how wonderful and precocious this Santez child was. One might have thought that all the tenderness and exaltation of the whole race had been stored up in this last one. He was always dreaming and walking about alone in a great alley of elms leading from the chateau to the forest. I watched from my window this sentimental boy, who walked with thoughtful steps, his hands behind his back, his head bent, and at times stopping to raise his eyes as if he could see and understand things that were not comprehensible at his age. Often after dinner on clear evenings, he would say to me, let us go outside and dream, cousin, and we would go outside together in the park. He would stop quickly before a clearing where the white vapor of the moon lights the woods, and he would press my hand, saying, Look, look, but you don't understand me. I feel it. If you understood me, we would be happy. One must love to know. I would laugh and then kiss this child, who loved me madly. Often after dinner, he would sit on my mother's knees. Come, auntie, he would say, tell me some love stories. And my mother, as a joke, would tell him all the old legends of the family all the passionate adventures of his forefathers, for thousands of them were current, some true and some false. It was their reputation for love and gallantry which was the ruin of every one of these men. They gloried in it, and then they thought that they had to live up to the renown of their house. The little fellow became exalted by these tender or terrible stories, and at times he would clap his hands, crying, I too, I too know how to love, better than all of them. Then he began to court me in a timid and tender manner, at which everyone laughed. It was so amusing. Every morning I had some flowers picked by him, and every evening before going to his room he would kiss my hand and murmur, I love you. I was guilty, very guilty, and I grieved continually about it, and I have been doing penance all my life. I have remained an old maid, or rather, I have lived as a widowed fiancé, his widow. I was amused at this childish tenderness, and I even encouraged him. I was coquettish, as charming as with a man, alternately caressing and severe. I maddened this child. It was a game for me, and a joyous diversion for his mother and mine. He was twelve. Think of it. Who would have taken this Adam's passion seriously? I kissed him as often as he wished. I even wrote him little notes, which were read by our respective mothers, and he answered me by passionate letters, which I have kept. Judging himself as a man, he thought that our loving intimacy was secret. We had forgotten that he was a Santez. This lasted for about a year. One evening in the park he fell at my feet, and, as he madly kissed the hem of my dress, he kept repeating, 
I love you. I love you. I love you. If you ever deceive me, if ever you leave me for another, I'll do as my father did. And he added in a hoarse voice, which gave me a shiver. You know what he did. I stood there astonished. He arose, and standing on the tips of his toes in order to reach my ear, for I was taller than he, he pronounced my first name, Genevieve, in such a gentle, sweet, tender tone that I trembled all over. I stammered, let us return, let us return. He said no more and followed me, but as we were going up the steps of the porch, he stopped me, saying, you know, if you ever leave me, I'll kill myself. This time I understood that I had gone too far, and I became quite reserved. One day, as he was approaching me for this, I answered, You are now too old for jesting and too young for serious love. I'll wait. I thought that this would end the matter. In the autumn, he was sent to boarding school. When he returned the following summer, I was engaged to be married. He understood immediately, and for a week he became so pensive that I was quite anxious. On the morning of the ninth day, I saw a little paper under my door as I got up. I seized it, opened it, and read, You have deserted me, and you know what I said. It is death to which you have condemned me. As I do not wish to be found by another than you, come to the park just where I told you last year that I loved you and look in the air. I thought that I should go mad. I dressed as quickly as I could and ran wildly to the place that he had mentioned. His little cap was on the ground in the mud. It had been raining all night. I raised my eyes and saw something swinging among the leaves, for the wind was blowing a gale. I don't know what I did after that. I must have screamed at first, then fainted and fallen, and finally have run to the chateau. The next thing I remember, I was in bed with my mother sitting beside me. I thought that I had dreamed all this in a frightful nightmare. I stammered, and what of him? What of him, Gontran? There was no answer. It was true. I did not dare see him again, but I asked for a lock of his blonde hair. Here, here it is. And the old maid stretched out her trembling hand in a despairing gesture. Then she blew her nose several times, wiped her eyes, and continued. I broke off my marriage, without saying why, and I, I have always remained the, the widow of this thirteen-year-old boy and then her head fell on her breast and she wept for a long time. As the guests were retiring for the night, a large man, whose quiet she had disturbed, whispered in his neighbor's ear, Isn't it unfortunate to be so, so sentimental? End of section 171. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 172 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 172. The Englishman of Etretat. A great English poet has just crossed over to France in order to greet Victor Hugo. All the newspapers are full of his name, and he is the great topic of conversation in all drawing rooms. Fifteen years ago, I had occasion, several times, to meet Algernon Charles Swinburne. I will attempt to show him just as I saw him, and to give an idea of the strange impression he made on me, which will remain with me throughout time. I believe it was in 1867 or 1868 that an unknown young Englishman came to Etretat and bought a little hut hidden under great trees. It was said that he lived there, always alone, in a strange manner, and he aroused the inimical surprise of the natives, for the inhabitants were sullen and foolishly malicious, as they always are in little towns. They declared that this whimsical Englishman ate nothing but boiled, roasted, or stewed monkey, that he would see no one, that he talked to himself hours at a time, and many other surprising things that made people think that he was different from other men. They were surprised that he should live alone with a monkey. Had it been a cat or a dog, they would have said nothing. But a monkey? Was that not frightful? What savage taste the man must have! I knew this young man only from seeing him in the streets. He was short, plump without being fat, mild-looking, and he wore a little blonde mustache, which was almost invisible. Chance brought us together. This savage had amiable and pleasing manners, but he was one of those strange Englishmen that one meets here and there throughout the world. Endowed with remarkable intelligence, he seemed to live in a fantastic dream as Edgar Poe must have lived. He had translated into English a volume of strange Icelandic legends, which I ardently desired to see translated into French. He loved the supernatural, the dismal, and the gruesome, but he spoke of the most marvelous things with a calmness that was typically English, to which his gentle and quiet voice gave a semblance of reality that was maddening. Full of a haughty disdain for the world, with its conventions, prejudices, and code of morality, he had nailed to his house a name that was boldly impudent. The keeper of a lonely inn who should write on his door, Travelers murdered here, could not make a more sinister jest. I never had entered his dwelling, when one day I received an invitation to luncheon, following an accident that had occurred to one of his friends, who had been almost drowned and whom I attempted to rescue. 
Although I wasn't able to reach the man until he had already been rescued, I received the hearty thanks of the two Englishmen, and the following day I called upon them. The friend was a man about thirty years old. He bore an enormous head on a child's body, a body without chest or shoulders. An immense forehead, which seemed to have engulfed the rest of the man, expanded like a dome above a thin face which ended in a little pointed beard. Two sharp eyes and a peculiar mouth gave one the impression of the head of a reptile, while the magnificent brow suggested a genius. A nervous twitching shook this peculiar being, who walked, moved, acted like jerks like a broken spring. This was Algernon Charles Swinburne, son of an English admiral and grandson on the maternal side of the Earl of Ashburnham. His strange countenance was transfigured when he spoke. I have seldom seen a man more impressive, more eloquent, incisive, or charming in conversation. His rapid, clear, piercing, and fantastic imagination seemed to creep into his voice and to lend life to his words. His brusque gestures enlivened his speech, which penetrated one like a dagger, and he had bursts of thought, just as lighthouses throw out flashes of fire, great genial lights that seemed to illuminate a whole world of ideas. The home of the two friends was pretty and by no means commonplace. Everywhere there were paintings, some superb, some strange, representing different conceptions of insanity. Unless I am mistaken, there was a watercolor which represented the head of a dead man, floating in a rose-colored shell on a boundless ocean, under a moon with a human face. Here and there I come across bones. I clearly remember a flayed hand on which was hanging some dried skin and black muscles, and on the snow-white bones could be seen the traces of dried blood. The food was a riddle which I could not solve. Was it good? Was it bad? I could not say. Some roast monkey took away all desire to make a steady diet of this animal, and the great monkey who roamed about among us at large and playfully pushed his head into my glass when I wished to drink cured me of any desire I might have to take one of his brothers as a companion for the rest of my days. As for the two men, they gave me the impression of two strange, original, remarkable minds, belonging to that peculiar race of talented madmen from among whom have risen Poe, Hoffman, and many others. If a genius is, as is commonly believed, a sort of aberration of great minds, then Algernon Charles Swinburne is undoubtedly a genius. Great minds that are healthy are never considered geniuses, while this sublime qualification is lavished on brains that are often inferior but are slightly touched by madness. At any rate, this poet remains one of the first of his time through his originality and polished form. He is an exalted lyrical singer who seldom bothers about the good and humble truth, which French poets are now seeking so persistently and patiently. He strives to set down dreams, subtle thoughts, sometimes great, sometimes visibly forced, but sometimes magnificent. Two years later, I found the house closed and its tenants gone. The furniture was being sold. In memory of them, I bought the hideous flayed hand. On the grass, an enormous square block of granite bore this simple word, Nip. Above this, a hollow stone offered water to the birds. It was the grave of the monkey who had been hanged by a young, vindictive Negro servant. It was said that this violent domestic had been forced to flee at the point of his exasperated master's revolver. After wandering about without home or food for several days, he returned and began to peddle barley sugar in the streets. He was expelled from the country after he had almost strangled a displeased customer. The world would be gayer if one could often meet homes like that. End of section 172. Recording by Tatiana Chachilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 173 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 173. Magnetism. It was a men's dinner party, and they were sitting over their cigars and brandy and discussing magnetism, Donato's tricks and Charcot's experiments. Presently, the skeptical, easy-going men, who cared nothing for religion of any sort, began telling stories of strange occurrences, incredible things which, nevertheless, had really occurred, so they said, falling back into superstitious beliefs, clinging to these last remnants of the marvelous, becoming devotees of this mystery of magnetism, defending it in the name of science. There was only one person who smiled, a vigorous young fellow, a great ladies' man who was so incredulous that he would not even enter upon a discussion of such matters. He repeated with a sneer, Humbug! 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 We need not discuss Donato, who is merely a very smart juggler, as for Monsieur Charcot, who is said to be a remarkable man of science, he produces on me the effect of those storytellers of the school of Edgar Poe, who end by going mad through constantly reflecting on queer cases of insanity. He has authenticated some cases of unexplained and inexplicable nervous phenomena. He makes his way into that unknown region which men are exploring every day, and are unable to understand what he sees. He recalls, perhaps, the ecclesiastical interpretation of these mysteries. 
I should like to hear what he says himself. The words of the unbeliever were listened to with a kind of pity, as if he had blasphemed in an assembly of monks. One of these gentlemen exclaimed, And yet miracles were performed in olden times. I deny it, replied the other. Why cannot they be performed now? Then each mentioned some fact, some fantastic presentiment, some instance of souls communicating with each other across space, or some case of the secret influence of one being over another. They asserted and maintained that these things had actually occurred, while the skeptic angrily repeated, Humbug! 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 At last he rose, threw away his cigar, and with his hands in his pockets said, Well, I also have two stories to tell you, which I will afterwards explain. Here they are. In the little village of Etretat, the men, who are all seafaring folk, go every year to Newfoundland to fish for cod. One night the little son of one of these fishermen woke up to a start, crying out that his father was dead. The child was quieted, and again he woke up exclaiming that his father was drowned. A month later the news came back that his father had, in fact, been swept off the deck of his smack by a billow. The widow then remembered how her son had woken up and spoken of his father's death. Everyone said it was a miracle, and the affair caused a great sensation. The dates were compared, and it was found that the accident and the dream were almost coincident, whence they concluded that they had happened on the same night and at the same hour. And there is a mystery of magnetism. The storyteller stopped suddenly. Thereupon, one of those who had heard him, much affected by the narrative, said, And can you explain this? Perfectly, monsieur. I have discovered the secret. The circumstance surprised me and even perplexed me very much. But you see, I do not believe on principle. Just as others begin by believing, I begin by doubting. And when I cannot understand, I continue to deny that there can be any telepathic communication between souls, certain that my own intelligence will be able to explain it. Well, I kept on inquiring into the matter, and by dint of questioning all the wives of the absent seamen, I was convinced that not a week passed without one of them, or one of their children, dreaming and declaring when they woke up that the father was drowned. The horrible and continual fear of this accident makes them always talk about it. Now, if one of these frequent predictions coincides by a simple chance with the death of the person referred to, people at once believe it to be a miracle, for they suddenly lose sight of all the other predictions of misfortune that have remained fulfilled. I myself have known fifty cases where the person who made the prediction forgot all about it a week afterwards. But if, then one happens to die, then the recollection of the thing is immediately revived, and people are ready to believe in the intervention of God, according to some, and magnetism, according to others. One of the smokers remarked, What you say is right enough, but what about your second story? Oh, my second story is a very delicate matter to relate. It happened to myself, and so I don't place any great value on my own view of the matter. An interested party can never give an impartial opinion. However, here it is. Among my acquaintances was a young woman on whom I had never bestowed a thought, whom I had never even looked at attentively, never taken any notice of. I classed her among the women of no importance, though she was not bad-looking. She appeared, in fact, to possess eyes, a nose, a mouth, some sort of hair, just a colorless type of countenance. She was one of those beings who awaken only a chance passing thought, but no interest, no desire. Well, one night, as I was writing some letters by my fireside before going to bed, I was conscious, in the midst of that train of sensuous visions that sometimes pass through one's brain in moments of idle reverie, of a kind of slight influence passing over me, a little flutter of the heart, and immediately without any cause, without any logical connection of thought, I saw distinctly as if I were touching her, saw from head to foot, and disrobed this young woman whom I had never given more than three seconds thought at a time. I suddenly discovered in her a number of qualities which I had never before observed, a sweet charm, a languorous fascination. She wakened in me that sort of restless emotion that causes one to pursue a woman, but I did not think of her long. I went to bed and was soon asleep, and I dreamed. You have all had these strange dreams which make you overcome the impossible, which open to you double-locked doors, unexpected joys, tightly folded arms? Which of us in these troubled, excising, breathless slumbers has not held, clasped, embraced with rapture the woman who occupied his thoughts? And have you ever noticed what superhuman delight these happy dreams give us? Into what mad intoxication they cast you? And with what passionate spasms they shake you? and with what infinite, caressing, penetrating tenderness they fill your heart for her, whom you had clasped in your arms in that adorable illusion that is so like reality. All this I felt with unforgettable violence. This woman was mine, so much mine that the pleasant warmth of her skin remained in my fingers, the odor of her skin in my brain, the taste of her kisses on my lips, the sound of her voice lingered in my ears, the touch of her clasp still clung to me, 
and the burning charm of her tenderness still gratified my senses long after the delight but disillusion of my awakening, and three times that night I had the same dream. When the day dawned and she haunted me, possessed me, filled my senses to such an extent that I was not one second without thinking of her. At last, not knowing what to do, I dressed myself and went to call her. As I went upstairs to her apartment, I was so overcome by emotion that I trembled, my heart beating rapidly. I entered the apartment. She rose the moment she heard my name mentioned, and suddenly our eyes met in a peculiar fixed gaze. I sat down. I stammered out some commonplaces which she seemed not to hear. I did not know what to say or do. Then, abruptly, clasping my arms round her, my dream was realized so suddenly that I began to doubt whether I was really awake. We were friends after this for two years. "'What conclusion do you draw from it?' said a voice. The storyteller seemed to hesitate. "'The conclusion I draw from it... Well, by Jove, the conclusion is that it was just a coincidence. And then, who can tell? Perhaps it was some glance of hers which I had not noticed and which came back that night to me through one of those mysterious and unconscious recollections that often bring before us things ignored by our own consciousness, unperceived by our minds.' "'Call it whatever you like,' said one of his table companions when the story was finished. "'But if you don't believe in magnetism after that, my dear boy, you are an ungrateful fellow.'" End of section 173. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 174 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 174. A Father's Confession. All Vizier Lerthel had followed the funeral procession of Monsieur Badon Lermins to the grave, and the last words of the funeral oration pronounced by the delegate of the district remained in the minds of all. He was an honest man, at least. An honest man he had been in all the known acts of his life, in his words, in his examples, his attitude, his behavior, his enterprises, in the cut of his beard and the shape of his hats. He never had said a word that did not set an example, never had given an alms without adding a word of advice, never had extended his hand without appearing to bestow a benediction. He left two children, a boy and a girl. His son was counselor general, and his daughter, having married a lawyer, Monsieur Poirel de la Voult, moved in the best society of Vizier. They were inconsolable with the death of their father, whom they loved sincerely. As soon as the ceremony was over, the son, daughter, and son-in-law returned to the house of mourning and, shutting themselves in the library, they opened the will, the seals of which were to be broken by them alone, and only after the coffin had been placed in the ground. This wish was expressed by a notice on the envelope. Monsieur Poirel de Levolt tore open the envelope, in his character of a lawyer used to such operations, and having adjusted his spectacles, he read in a monotonous voice, made for reading the details of contracts. My children, my dear children, I could not sleep the eternal sleep in peace if I did not make to you from the tomb a confession. The confession of a crime, remorse for which has ruined my life. Yes, I committed a crime, a frightful, abominable crime. I was twenty-six years old, and I had just been called to the bar in Paris, and was living the life off young men from the provinces who are stranded in this town without acquaintances, relatives, or friends. I took a sweetheart. There are beings who cannot live alone. I was one of those. Solitude fills me with horrible anguish, the solitude of my room beside my fire in the evening. I feel then as if I were alone on the earth alone but surrounded by vague dangers, unknown and terrible things, and the partition that separates me from my neighbor, my neighbor whom I do not know, keeps me at as great a distance from him as the stars that I see through my window. A sort of fever pervades me, a fever of impatience and of fear, and the silence of the walls terrifies me. The silence of a room where one lives alone is so intense and so melancholy. It is not only a silence of the mind. When a piece of furniture cracks, a shudder goes through you, for you expect no noise in this melancholy abode. How many times, nervous and timid from this motionless silence, I have begun to talk, to repeat words without rhyme or reason, only to make some sound. My voice at those times sounds so strange that I am afraid of that, too. Is there anything more dreadful than talking to oneself in an empty house? One's voice sounds like that of another, an unknown voice talking aimlessly to no one, into the empty air, with no ear to listen to it, for one knows before they escape into the solitude of the room exactly what words will be uttered, and when they resound lugubriously in the silence, they seem no more than an echo, the peculiar echo of words whispered by one's thought. My sweetheart was a young girl, like other grown girls who live in Paris, on wages that are insufficient to keep them. She was gentle, good, simple. Her parents lived at Poissy. She went to spend several days with them from time to time. For a year I lived quietly with her, fully decided to leave her when I should find someone whom I liked well enough to marry. 
I would make a little provision for this one, for it is an understood thing in our social set that a woman's love should be paid for, in money if she is poor, in presents if she is rich. But one day she told me she was not sant. I was thunderstruck, and I saw in a second that my life would be ruined. I saw the fetter that I should wear until my death everywhere, in my future family life, in my old age, forever. The fetter of a woman bound to my life through a child. The fetter of the child whom I must bring up, watch over, protect, while keeping myself unknown to him and keeping him hidden from the world. I was greatly disturbed at this news, and a confused longing, a criminal desire surged through my mind. I did not formulate it, but I felt it in my heart, ready to come to the surface, as if someone hidden behind a portiere should await the signal to come out. If some accident might only happen. So many of these little beings die before they are born. Oh, I did not wish my sweetheart to die. The poor girl, I loved her very much. But I wished possibly that the child might die before I saw it. He was born. I set up housekeeping in my little bachelor apartment, our imitation home, with a horrible child. He looked like all children. I did not care for him. Fathers, you see, do not show affection until later. They have not the instinctive and possessive tenderness of mothers. Their affection has to be wakened gradually. Their mind must become attached by bonds formed each day between beings that live in each other's society. A year passed. I now avoided my home, which was too small, where soiled linen, baby clothes, and stockings the size of gloves were lying round, where a thousand articles of all descriptions lay on the furniture, on the arm of an easy chair, everywhere. I went out chiefly that I might not hear the child cry, for he cried on the slightest pretext, when he was bathed, when he was touched, when he was put to bed, when he was taken up in the morning, incessantly. I had made a few acquaintances, and I met at a reception the woman who was to be her mother. I fell in love with her and became desirous to marry her. I courted her, I asked her parents' consent to the marriage, and it was granted. I found myself in this dilemma. I must either marry this young girl whom I adored, having a child already, or else tell the truth and renounce her, and happiness, my future, everything for her parents, who were people of rigid principles, would not give her to me if they knew. I passed a month of horrible anguish, of mental torture, a month haunted by a thousand frightful thoughts, and I felt developing me a hatred toward my son, toward that little morsel of living, screaming flesh who blocked my path, interrupted my life, condemned me to an existence without hope, without all those vague expectations to make the charm of youth. But just then my companion's mother became ill, and I was left alone with the child. It was December, and the weather was terribly cold. What a night! My companion had just left. I had dined alone in my little dining room, and I went gently into the room where the little one was asleep. I sat down in an armchair before the fire. The wind was blowing, making the windows rattle, a dry, frosty wind, and I saw through the window the stars shining with that piercing brightness that they have on frosty nights. Then the idea that had obsessed me for a month rose again to the surface. As soon as I was quiet, it came to me and harassed me. It ate into my mind like a fixed idea, just as cancers must eat into the flesh. It was there, in my head, in my heart, in my whole body. It seemed to me, and it swallowed me up as a wild beast might have. I endeavored to drive it away, to repulse it, to open my mind to other thoughts, as one opens a window to the fresh morning breeze to drive out the vitiated air. But I could not drive it from my brain, not even for a second. I do not know how to express this torture. It gnawed at my soul, and I felt a frightful pain, a real physical and moral pain. My life was ruined. How could I escape from this situation? How could I draw back, and how could I confess? And I loved the one who was to become your mother with a mad passion, which this insurmountable obstacle only aggravated. A terrible rage was taking possession of me, choking me, a rage that verged on madness. Surely I was crazy that evening. The child was sleeping. I got up and looked at it as it slept. It was he, this abortion, this spawn, this nothing, that condemned me to irremediable unhappiness. He was asleep, his mouth open, wrapped in his bedclothes in a crib beside my bed, where I could not sleep. How did I ever do what I did? How do I know? What force urged me on? What malevolent power took possession of me? Oh, the temptation to crime came without any forewarning. All I recall is that my heart beat tumultuously. It beat so hard that I could hear it, as one hears the strokes of a hammer behind a partition. That is all I can recall, the beating of my heart. In my head there was a strange confusion, a tumult, a senseless disorder, a lack of presence of mind. It was one of those hours of bewilderment and hallucination when a man is neither conscious of his actions nor able to guide his will. I gently raised the coverings from the body of the child, I turned them down to the foot of the crib, and he lay there uncovered and naked. He did not wake. Then I went toward the window, softly, quite softly, and I opened it. A breath of icy air glided in like an assassin, 
It was so cold that I drew aside and the two candles flickered. I remained standing near the window, not daring to turn around, as if for fear of seeing what was doing on behind me, and feeling the icy air continually across my forehead, my cheeks, my hands, the deadly air which kept streaming in, I stood there a long time. I was not thinking. I was not reflecting. All at once a little cough caused me to shudder frightfully from head to foot, a shudder that I still feel to the roots of my hair, and for the frantic movement I abruptly covered both sides of the window and turning round ran over to the crib. He was still asleep, his mouth open, quite naked. I touched his legs, they were icy cold and I covered them up. My heart was suddenly touched, grieved, filled with pity, tenderness, love for this poor innocent being that I had wished to kill. I kissed his fine soft hair long and tenderly, and then I went and sat down before the fire. I reflected with amazement with horror on what I had done, asking myself whence come these tempests of the soul in which a man loses all perspective of things, all command over himself, and acts as in a condition of mad intoxication, not knowing whither he is going, like a vessel in a hurricane. The child coughed again and it gave my heart a wrench. Suppose it should die. Oh God, oh God, what would become of me? I rose from my chair to go look at him with a candle in my hand. I leaned over him. Seeing him breathing quietly, I felt reassured when he coughed a third time. It gave me such a shock that I started backward, just as one does at the sight of something horrible, and let my candle fall. As I stood erect after picking it up, I noticed that my temples were bathed in perspiration, that cold sweat which is the result of anguish of soul, and I remained until daylight bending over my son, becoming calm when he remained quiet for some time, and filled with atrocious pain when a weak cough came from his mouth. He awoke with his eyes red, his throat choked, and with an air of suffering. When the woman came in to arrange my room, I sent her at once for a doctor. He came at the end of an hour, and, after examining the child, did he not catch cold? I began to tremble like a person with palsy, and I faltered, No, I do not think so. And then I said, What is the matter? Is it serious? I do not know yet, he replied. I will come again this evening. He came that evening. My son had remained almost all day in a condition of drowsiness, coughing from time to time. During the night, inflammation of the lungs set in. That lasted ten days. I cannot express what I suffered in those interminable hours that divide morning from night, night from morning. He died. And since, since that moment, I have not passed one hour, not a single hour, without the frightful burning recollection, a gnawing recollection, a memory that seems to wring my heart, awaking in me like a savage beast imprisoned in the depth of my soul. Oh, if I could have gone mad! Monsieur Poirel de Levolte raised his spectacles with a motion that was peculiar to him whenever he finished reading a contract, and the three heirs of the defunct looked at one another without speaking, pale and motionless. At the end of a minute, the lawyer resumed. This must be destroyed. The other two bent their heads in a sign of assent. He lighted a candle, carefully separated the pages containing the damaging confession from those relating to the disposition of money, and then he held them over the candle and threw them into the fireplace. And they watched the white sheets as they burned till they were presently reduced to little crumbling black heaps. And as some words were still visible in the white tracing, the daughter, with little strokes of the toe of her shoe, crushed the burning paper, mixing it with the old ashes in the fireplace. Then all three stood there watching it for some time, as if they feared that the destroyed secret might escape from the fireplace. End of section 174. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 175 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 175. A Mother of Monsters. I recalled this horrible story, the events of which occurred long ago, and this horrible woman, the other day at a fashionable seaside resort, where I saw on the beach a well-known, young, elegant, and charming Parisienne, adored and respected by everyone. I had been invited by a friend to pay him a visit in a little provincial town. He took me about in all directions to do the honors of the place, showed me noted scenes, chateaus, industries, ruins, he pointed out monuments, churches, old carved doorways, enormous or distorted trees, the oak of St. Andrew, and the yew tree of Roqueboise. When I had exhausted my admiration and enthusiasm over all the sights, my friend said with a distressed expression on his face that there was nothing left to look at. I breathed freely. I would now be able to rest under the shade of the trees. But all at once he uttered an exclamation. Oh, yes, we have the mother of monsters. I must take you to see her. "'Who is that, the mother of monsters?' I asked. "'She is an abominable woman,' he replied. "'A regular demon, a being who voluntarily brings into the world deformed, 
hideous, frightful children, monstrosities, in fact, and then sells them to showmen who exhibit such things. These exploiters of freaks come from time to time to find out if she has any fresh monstrosity, and if it meets with their approval, they carry it away with them, paying the mother a compensation. She has eleven of this description. She is rich. You think I am joking, romancing, exaggerating. No, my friend, I am telling you the truth, the exact truth. Let us go and see this woman. Then I will tell you her history. He took me into one of the suburbs. The woman lived in a pretty little house by the side of the road. It was attractive and well-kept. The garden was filled with fragrant flowers. One might have supposed it to be the residence of a retired lawyer. A maid ushered us into a sort of little country parlor, and the wretch appeared. She was about forty. She was a tall, big woman with hard features, but well-formed, vigorous and healthy, the true type of a robust peasant woman, half animal and half woman. She was aware of her reputation and received everyone with a humility that smacked of hatred. "'What do the gentlemen wish?' she asked. "'They tell me that your last child is just like an ordinary child, that he does not resemble his brothers at all,' replied my friend. "'I wanted to be sure of that. Is it true?' She cast a malicious and furious look as she said, "'Oh, no, oh, no, my poor sir. He is perhaps even uglier than the rest. I have no luck, no luck. They are all like that. It is heartbreaking. How can the good God be so hard on a poor woman who is all alone in the world? How can he?' She spoke hurriedly, her eyes cast down with a deprecating air as of a wild beast who is afraid. Her harsh voice became soft, and it seemed strange to hear those tearful falsetto tones issuing from that big bony frame of unusual strength and with coarse outlines, which seemed fitted for violent action, and she made to utter howls like a wolf. "'We should like to see your little one,' said my friend. I fancied she colored up. I may have been deceived. After a few moments of silence, she said in a louder tone, "'What good will that do you?' "'Why do you not wish to show it to us?' replied my friend. "'There are many people to whom you will show it. You know whom I mean.' She gave a start, and resuming her natural voice and giving free play to her anger, she screamed, was that why you came here? To insult me? Because my children are like animals, tell me? You shall not see him. No, no, you shall not see him. Go away. Go away. I do not know why you all try to torment me like that. She walked over toward us, her hands on her hips. At the brutal tone of her voice, a sort of moaning, or rather a mewing, the lamentable cry of an idiot came from the adjoining room. I shivered to the marrow of my bones. We retreated before her. Take care, devil, they called her the devil, said my friend. Take care, some day you will get yourself into trouble through this. She began to tremble, beside herself with fury, shaking her fist and roaring, Be off with you! What will get me into trouble? Be off with you, miscreants! She was about to attack us, but we fled, saddened at what we had seen. When we got outside, my friend said, Well, you have seen her. What do you think of her? Tell me the story of this brute, I replied. And this is what he told me as we walked along the white high road with ripe crops on either side of it which rippled like the sea in the light breeze that passed over them. This woman was once a servant on a farm. She was an honest girl, steady and economical. She was never known to have an admirer and never suspected of any frailty, but she went astray as so many do. She soon found herself in trouble and was tortured with fear and shame. Wishing to conceal her misfortune, she bound her body tightly with a corset of her own invention, made of boards and cord. The more she developed, the more she bound herself with this instrument of torture, suffering martyrdom, but brave in her sorrow, not allowing anyone to see or suspect anything. She maimed the little unborn thing, cramping it with that frightful corset, and made a monster of it. Its head was squeezed and elongated to a point, and its large eyes seemed popping out of its head. Its limbs, exaggeratedly long, had twisted like the stalk of a vine, terminated in fingers like the claws of a spider. Its trunk was tiny and round as a nut. The child was born in an open field, and when the leaders saw it, they fled away, screaming, and the report spread that she had given birth to a demon. From that time on, she was called the devil. She was driven from the farm and lived on charity under a cloud. She brought up the monster, whom she hated with a savage hatred, and would have strangled, perhaps, if the priest had not threatened her with arrest. One day, some traveling showmen heard about the frightful creature and asked to see it, so that if it pleased them, they might take it away. They were pleased and counted out five hundred francs to the mother. At first she refused to let them see the little animal, as she was ashamed, but when she discovered it had a money value, and that these people were anxious to get it, she began to haggle with them, raising her price with all a peasant's persistence. She made them draw up a paper, in which they promised to pay her four hundred francs a year besides, as though they had taken this deformity into their employ. Incited by the greed of gain, she continued to produce these phenomena, so as to have an assured income like a bourgeois. Some of them were long, some short, some like crabs, all bodies, other like lizards. Several died and she was heartbroken. 
The law tried to interfere, but as they had no proof, they let her continue to produce her freaks. She has at this moment 11 alive, and they bring in, on average, counting good and bad years, from five to 6,000 francs a year. One alone is not placed, the one she was unwilling to show us, but she will not keep it for long, for she is known to all the showmen in the world, who come from time to time to see if she has anything new. She even gets bids on them when the monster is valuable. My friend was silent. A profound disgust stirred my heart, and a feeling of rage, of regret, to think that I had not strangled this brute when I had the opportunity. I had forgotten this story when I saw on the beach of a fashionable resort the other day an elegant, charming, dainty woman surrounded by men who paid her respect as well as admiration. I was walking along the beach, arm in arm with a friend, the resident physician. Ten minutes later, I saw a nursemaid with three children who were rolling in the sand. A pair of little crutches lay on the ground and touched my sympathy. I then noticed that these three children were all deformed, humpbacked, or crooked, and hideous. "'Those are the offspring of that charming woman you saw just now,' said the doctor. I was filled with pity for her, as well as for them, and exclaimed, "'Oh, the poor mother! How can she ever laugh?' "'Do not pity her, my friend. Pity these poor children,' replied the doctor. "'This is the consequence of preserving a slender figure up to the last. These little deformities were made by the corset. She knows very well that she is risking her life at this game.' but what does she care as long as she can be beautiful and have admirers? And then I recalled that other woman, the peasant, the devil, who sold her children, her monsters. End of section 175. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 176 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This is LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 176. An Uncomfortable Bed. One autumn I went to spend the hunting season with some friends in a chateau in Picardy. My friends were fond of practical jokes. I do not care to know people who are not. When I arrived, they gave me a princely reception, which at once awakened suspicion in my mind. They fired off rifles, embraced me, made much of me, as if they expected to have great fun at my expense. I said to myself, Look out, old ferret, they have something in store for you. During the dinner, the mirth was excessive, exaggerated, in fact. I thought, here are people who have more than their share of amusement and apparently without reason. They must have planned some good joke. Assuredly, I am to be the victim of a joke. Attention! During the entire evening, everyone laughed in an exaggerated fashion. I scented a practical joke in the air as a dog sense game. But what was it? I was watchful, restless. I did not let out a word or a meaning or a gesture escape me. Everyone seemed to me an object of suspicion, and I even looked distrustfully at the faces of the servants. The hour struck for retiring, and the whole household came to escort me to my room. Why? They called to me, Good night. I entered the apartment, shut the door, and remained standing without moving a single step, holding the wax candle in my hand. I heard laughter and whispering in the corridor. Without a doubt, they were spying on me. I cast a glance around the walls, the furniture, the ceiling, the hangings, the floor— I saw nothing to justify suspicion. I heard persons moving about outside my door. I had no doubt they were looking through the keyhole. An idea came into my head. My candle may suddenly go out and leave me in darkness. Then I went across the mantelpiece and lighted all the wax candles that were on it. After that, I cast another glance around me without discovering anything. I advanced with short steps, carefully examining the apartment. Nothing. I inspected every article, one after the other. Still nothing. I went over to the window. The shutters, large wooden shutters, were open. I shut them with great care, then drew the curtains, enormous velvet curtains, and placed a chair in front of them so as to have nothing to fear from outside. Then I cautiously sat down. The armchair was solid. I did not venture to get into the bed. However, the night was advancing, and I ended by coming to the conclusion that I was foolish. If they were spying on me, as I suppose they must, while waiting for the success of a joke they had been preparing for me, had been laughing immoderately at my terror, so I made up my mind to go to bed, but the bed was particularly suspicious-looking. I pulled at the curtains. They seemed to be secure. All the same, there was the danger. I was going, perhaps, to receive a cold shower, both from overhead, or perhaps the moment I stretched myself out to find myself sinking to the floor with my mattress. I searched in my memory for all the practical jokes of which I ever had experience, and I did not want to be caught. Ah, certainly not. Certainly not. Then I suddenly bethought myself of a precaution which I considered ensured safety. I caught hold of the side of the mattress gingerly and very slowly drew it toward me. It came away, followed by the sheet and the rest of the bedclothes. I dragged all these objects into the very middle of the room, facing the entrance door. 
I made my bed over again as best I could at some distance from the suspected bedstead and the corner which had filled me with such anxiety. Then I extinguished all my candles, and groping my way, I slipped under the bedclothes. For at least another hour I remained awake, starting at the slightest sound. Everything seemed quiet in the chateau. I fell asleep. I must have been in a deep sleep for a long time, but all of a sudden I was awakened with a start by the fall of a heavy body tumbling right down on top of my own, and at the same time I received on my face, on my neck, and on my chest a burning liquid which made me utter a howl of pain, and a dreadful noise as if a sideboard laden with plates and dishes had fallen down almost deafened me. I was smothering beneath the weight that was crushing me and preventing me from moving. I stretched out my hand to find out what was the nature of this object. I felt a face, a nose, and whiskers. Then, with all my strength, I launched a blow at the face, but I immediately received a hail of cuffings which made me jump straight out of the soaked sheets and rush in my nightshirt into the corridor, the door of which I found open. Oh, heavens, it was broad daylight! The noise brought my friends hurrying into the apartment, and we found, sprawling over my improvised bed, the dismayed valet, who, while bringing me my morning cup of tea, had tripped over this obstacle in the middle of the floor and fallen on his stomach, spilling my breakfast over my face in spite of myself. The precautions I had taken in closing the shutters and going to sleep in the middle of the room had only brought about the practical joke I had been trying to avoid. Oh, how they all laughed that day! End of section 176. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 177 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 177. A Portrait. Hello, there's Milial, said somebody near me. I looked at the man who had been pointed out as I had been wishing for a long time to meet this Don Juan. He was no longer young. His gray hair looked a little like those fur bonnets worn by certain northern peoples, and his long beard, which fell down over his chest, had also somewhat the appearance of fur. He was talking to a lady, leaning toward her, speaking in a low voice, and looking at her with an expression full of respect and tenderness. I knew his life, or at least as much as was known of it. He had loved madly several times, and there had been certain tragedies with which his name had been connected. When I spoke to women who were the loudest in his praise, and asked him whence came this power, they always answered, after thinking for a while, I don't know, he has a certain charm about him. He was certainly not handsome. He had none of the elegance that we ascribe to conquerors of feminine hearts. I wonder what might be his hidden charm. Was it mental? I never had heard of a clever saying of his. In his glance, perhaps? Or in his voice? The voices of some beings have a certain irresistible attraction, almost like suggesting the flavor of good things to eat. One is hungry for them, and the sound of their words penetrates us like a dainty morsel. A friend was passing. I asked him, Do you know Monsieur Milial? Yes. Introduce us. A minute later, we were shaking hands and talking in the doorway. What he said was correct, agreeable to hear. It contained no irritable thought. The voice was sweet, soft, caressing, musical, but I had heard others much more attractive and much more moving. One listened to him with pleasure, just as one would look at a pretty little brook. No tension of the mind was necessary in order to follow him. No hidden meaning aroused curiosity. No expectation awoke interest. His conversation was rather restful, but it did not awaken in one either a desire to answer, to contradict, or to approve, and it was as easy to answer him as it was to listen to him. The response came to the lips of its own accord as soon as he had finished talking, and phrases turned toward him as if he had naturally aroused them. One thought soon struck me. I had known him for a quarter of an hour, and it seemed as if he were already one of my old friends, that I had known all about him for a long time, his face, his gestures, his voice, his ideas. Suddenly, after a few minutes of conversation, he seemed already to be installed in my intimacy. All constraint disappeared between us, and, had he so desired, I might have confided in him as one confides only in old friends. Certainly there was some mystery about him. Those barriers that are closed between most people and that are lowered with time when sympathy, similar tastes, equal intellectual culture, and constant intercourse remove constraint, those barriers seem not to exist between him and me, and no doubt this was the case between him and all people, both men and women, whom fate threw in his path. After half an hour we parted, promising to see each other often, and he gave me his address after inviting me to take luncheon with him in two days. I forgot what hour he had stated, and I arrived too soon. He was not yet home. A correct and silent domestic showed me into a beautiful, quiet, softly lighted parlor. I felt comfortable there, at home. How often I have noticed the influence of apartments on the character and on the mind. There are some which make one feel foolish, in others, on the contrary, one always feels lively. 
Some make us sad, although well-lighted and decorated in light-colored furniture. Others cheer us up, although hung with somber material. Our eye, like our heart, has its likes and dislikes, of which it does not inform us, and which it secretly imposes on our temperament. The harmony of furniture, walls, the style of an ensemble, act immediately on our mental state, just as the air from the woods, the sea, or the mountains modifies our physical natures. I sat down on a cushion-covered divan and felt myself suddenly carried and supported by these little silk bags of feathers, as if the outline of my body had been marked out beforehand on this couch. Then I looked about. There was nothing striking about the room. Everywhere were beautiful and modest things, simple and rare furniture, oriental curtains which did not seem to come from a department store but from the interior of a harem, and exactly opposite me hung the portrait of a woman. It was a portrait of medium size, showing the head and the upper part of the body, and the hands which were holding a book. She was young, bareheaded, ribbons were woven in her hair, she was smiling sadly. Was it because she was bareheaded? Was it merely her natural expression? I have never seen a portrait of a lady which seemed so much in its place as that one in that dwelling. Of all those I knew, I have never seen anything like that one. All those that I know are on exhibition, whether the lady be dressed in her gaudiest gown, with an attractive headdress, and a look which shows that she is posing first of all before the artist— and then before someone who will look at her whether they have taken a comfortable attitude in an ordinary gown. Some are standing majestically in all their beauty, which is not at all natural to them in life. All of them have something, a flower or a jewel, a crease in the dress or a curve of the lip, which one feels to have been placed there for effect by the artist. Whether they wear a hat or merely their hair, one can immediately notice that they are not entirely natural. Why? One cannot say without knowing them, but the effect is there. They seem to be calling somewhere, on people whom they wish to please and to whom they wish to appear at their best advantage, and they have studied their attitudes, sometimes modest, sometimes haughty. What could one say about this one? She was at home and alone. Yes, she was alone, for she was smiling as one smiles when thinking in solitude of something sad and sweet, not as one smiles when one is being watched. She seemed so much alone and so much at home that she made the whole large apartment seem absolutely empty. She alone lived in it, filled it, gave it life. Many people might come in and converse, laugh, even sing. She would still be alone with a solitary smile, and she alone would give it life with her pictured gaze. That look was also unique. It fell directly on me, fixed and caressing without seeing me. All portraits know that they are being watched, and they answer with their eyes, which see, think, follow us without leaving us from the very moment we enter the apartment they inhabit. This one did not see me. It saw nothing, although its look was fixed directly on me. I remembered the surprising verse of Baudelaire, and your eyes, attractive as those of a portrait. They did indeed attract me in an irresistible manner. Those painted eyes which had lived, or which were perhaps still living, threw over me a strange, powerful spell. Oh, what an infinite and tender charm, like a passing breeze, like a dying sunset of lilac, rose, and blue, a little sad like the approaching night, which comes behind the somber frame and out of those impenetrable eyes. Those eyes, created by a few strokes from a brush, hide behind them the mystery of that which seems to be and which does not exist, which can appear in the eyes of a woman, which can make love blossom within us. The door opened and Monsieur Millial entered. He excused himself for being late. I excused myself for being ahead of time. Then I said, Might I ask you who is this lady? He answered, That is my mother. She died very young. Then I understood whence came the inexplicable attraction of this man. End of section 177. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 178 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 178. The Drunkard. The north wind was blowing a hurricane, driving through the sky big, heavy, black clouds from which the rain poured down on the earth with terrific violence. A high sea was raging and dashing its huge, slow, foamy waves along the coast with the rumbling sound of thunder. The waves followed each other close, rolling in as high as mountains, scattering the foam as they broke. The storm engulfed itself in the little valley of Eport, whistling and moaning, tearing the shingles from the roofs, smashing the shutters, knocking down the chimneys, rushing through the narrow streets in such gusts that one could walk only by holding on to the walls, and children would have been lifted up like leaves and carried over the houses into the fields. The fishing smacks had been hauled up high on land, because at high tide the sea would sweep the beach. Several sailors, sheltered behind the curved bottoms of their boats, were watching this battle of the sky and the sea. Then one by one they went away, for night was falling on the storm, wrapping in shadows the raging ocean and all battling elements. 
Just two men remained, their hands plunged deep into their pockets, bending their backs beneath the squall, their woolen caps pulled down over their ears. Two big Normandy fishermen, bearded, their skin tanned through exposure, with its piercing black eyes of the sailor, who looks over the horizon like a bird of prey. One of them was saying, Come on, Jeremy, let's go play dominoes. It's my treat. The other hesitated a while, tempted on one hand by the game and the thought of Brandy, knowing well that if he went to Pomel's, he would return home drunk, held back, on the other hand, by the idea of his wife remaining alone in the house. He asked, Anyone might think that you had made a bet to get me drunk every night. Say, what good is it doing you, since it's always you that's treating? Nevertheless, he was smiling at the idea of all this brandy drunk at the expense of another. He was smiling the contented smirk of an avaricious Norman. Matheron, his friend, kept pulling him by the sleeve. Come on, Jeremy, this isn't the kind of night to go home without anything to warm you up. What are you afraid of? Isn't your wife going to warm your bed for you? Jeremy answered, The other night I couldn't find the door. I had to be fished out of the ditch in front of the house. He was still laughing at this drunkard's recollection, and he was unconsciously going toward Palmel's cafe, where a light was shining in the window. He was going, pulled by Matheron and pushed by the wind, unable to resist these combined forces. The low room was full of sailors, smoke, and noise. All these men, clad in woolens, their elbows on the tables, were shouting to make themselves heard. The more people came in, the more one had to shout in order to overcome the noise of voices and the rattling of dominoes on the marble tables. Jeremy and Matheron sat down in a corner and began a game, and the glasses were emptied in rapid succession into their thirsty throats. Then they played more games and drank more glasses. Matheron kept pouring and winking to the saloon keeper, a big red-faced man who chuckled as though at the thought of some fine joke, and Jeremy kept absorbing alcohol and wagging his head, giving vent to a roar of laughter and looking at his comrade with a stupid and contented expression. All the customers were going away. Every time that one of them would open the door to leave, a gust of wind would blow into the cafe, making the tobacco smoke swirl around, swinging the lamps at the end of their chains, and making their flames flicker, and suddenly one could hear the deep booming of a breaking wave and the moaning of the wind. Jeremy, his collar unbuttoned, was taking drunkard's poses, one leg outstretched, one arm hanging down, and in the other hand holding a domino. They were now alone with the owner, who had come up to them, interested. He asked, "'Well, Jeremy, how goes it inside? Feel less thirsty after wetting your throat?' Jeremy muttered, "'The more I wet it, the drier it gets inside.' The innkeeper cast a sly glance at Matheron. He said, "'And your brother, Matheron, where's he now?' The sailor laughed silently. "'Don't worry, he's warm, all right.' And both of them looked toward Jeremy, who was triumphantly putting down the double six and announcing, "'Game!' Then the owner declared, "'Well, boys, I'm going to bed. I'll leave you the lamp and the bottle. There's twenty cents worth in it. Lock the door when you go, Matheron, and slip the key under the mat the way you did the other night.' Matheron answered, "'Don't worry, it'll be all right.' Pomel shook hands with his two customers and slowly went up the wooden stairs. For several minutes his heavy step echoed through the little house. Then a loud creaking announced that he had got into bed. The two men continued to play. From time to time a more violent gust of wind would shake the whole house, and the two drinkers would look up, as though someone were about to enter. Then Matheron would take the bottle and fill Jeremy's glass. But suddenly the clock over the bar struck twelve. Its hoarse clang sounded like the rattling of saucepans. Then Matheron got up like a sailor whose watch is over. Come on, Jeremy, we've got to get out. The other man rose to his feet with difficulty, got his balance by leaning on the table, reached the door and opened it while his companion was putting out the light. As soon as they were in the street, Matheron locked the door and then said, Well, so long, see you tomorrow night, and he disappeared in the darkness. Jeremy took a few steps, staggered, stretched out his hands, met a wall which supported him, and began to tumble along. From time to time, a gust of wind would sweep through the street, pushing him forward, making him run for a few steps. Then when the wind would die down, he would stop short, having lost his impetus, and once more he would begin to stagger on his unsteady drunkard's legs. He went instinctively toward his home, just as birds go to their nests. Finally, he recognized his door and began to feel about for the keyhole and tried to put the key in it. Not finding the hole, he began to swear. Then he began to beat on the door with his fists, calling for his wife to come and help him. Melina! Oh, Melina! As he leaned against the door for support, it gave way and opened. And Jeremy, losing his prop, fell inside, rolling on his face into the middle of the room, and he felt something heavy pass over him and escape in the night. He was no longer moving, dazed by fright, bewildered, fearing the devil, ghosts, all the mysterious beings of darkness, and he waited a long time without daring to move. But when he found out that nothing else was moving, the little reason returned to him, the reason of a drunkard. Gently he sat up. Again he waited a long time, and at last, growing bolder, he called, Melina? His wife did not answer. 
Then suddenly a suspicion crossed his darkened mind, an indistinct, vague suspicion. He was not moving. He was sitting there in the dark, trying to gather together his scattered wits, his mind stumbling over incomplete ideas, just as his feet stumbled along. Once more he asked, Who was it, Melina? Tell me who it was. I won't hurt you. He waited. No voice was raised in the darkness. He was now reasoning with himself out loud. I'm drunk, all right. I'm drunk. And he filled me up, the dog. He did it to stop me going home. I'm drunk. And he would continue. Tell me who it was, Melina, or something will happen to you. After having waited again, he went on with the slow and obstinate logic of a drunkard. He's been keeping me at that loafer Pomel's place every night so as to stop me going home. It's some trick. Oh, you damned carrion. Slowly he got to his knees. A blind fury was gaining possession of him, mingling with the fumes of alcohol. He continued. Tell me who it was, Melina, or you'll get a licking. I warn you. He was now standing, trembling with wild fury, as though the alcohol had set his blood on fire. He took a step knocked against a chair, seized it, went on, reached the bed, ran his hands over it, and felt the warm body of his wife. Then, maddened, he roared, So, you were there, you piece of dirt, and you wouldn't answer. And lifting the chair, which he was holding in his strong sailor's grip, he swung it down before him with an exasperated fury. A cry burst from the bed, an agonizing, piercing cry. Then he began to thrash around like a thresher in a barn. And soon nothing more moved. The chair was broken to pieces, but he still held one leg and beat away with it, panting. At last he stopped to ask, Well, are you ready to tell me who it was? Molina did not answer. Then, tired out, stupefied from his exertion, he stretched himself out on the ground and slept. When day came, a neighbor, seeing the door open, entered. He saw Jeremy snoring on the floor amid the pieces of the chair, and on the bed a mess of pulp and flesh and blood. End of section 178. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 179 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 179. The Wardrobe. As we sat chatting after dinner, a party of men, the conversation turned on women for lack of something else. One of us said, here's a funny thing that happened to me on that very subject. And he told us the following story. One evening last winter, I suddenly felt overcome by that overpowering sense of misery and languor that takes possession of one from time to time. I was in my own apartment, all alone, and I was convinced that if I gave in to my feelings, I should have a terrible attack of melancholia, one of those attacks that lead to suicide when they recur too often. I put on my overcoat and went out without the slightest idea of what I was going to do. Having gone as far as the boulevards, I began to wander along by the almost empty cafes. It was raining, a fine rain that affects your mind as it does your clothing, not one of those good downpours which come down in torrents, driving breathless passers-by into doorways, but a rain without drops that deposits on your clothing an imperceptible spray, and soon covers you with a sort of iced foam that chills you through. What should I do? I walked in one direction and then came back, looking for some place where I could spend two hours, and discovering for the first time that there is no place of amusement in Paris in the evening. At last, I decided to go to the Folies Bergère, that entertaining resort for gay women. There were very few people in the main hall. In the long horseshoe curve, there were only a few ordinary-looking people, whose plebeian origin was apparent in their manners, their clothes, the cut of their hair and beard, their hats, their complexion. It was rarely that one saw from time to time a man whom you suspected of having washed himself thoroughly, and his whole makeup seemed to match. As for the women, they were always the same. Those frightful women you all know, ugly, tired-looking, drooping, and walking along in their lackadaisical manner, with that air of foolish superciliousness which they assume. I do not know why. I thought to myself that, in truth, not one of those languid creatures, greasy rather than fat, puffed out here and thin there, with the contour of a monk and the lower extremities of a bow-legged snipe, was worth the louis that they would get with great difficulty after asking five. But all at once I saw a little creature whom I thought attractive, not in her first youth, but fresh, comical, and tantalizing. I stopped her, and stupidly, without thinking, I made an appointment with her for later that night. I did not want to go back to my own home all alone, I preferred the company and the caresses of this hussy and I followed her. She lived in a great big house in the Rue de Martyrs. The gas was already extinguished on the stairway. I ascended the steps slowly, lighting a candle match every few seconds, stubbing my foot against the steps, stumbling and angry as I followed the rustle of the skirt ahead of me. She stopped on the fourth floor, and having closed the outer door, she said, Then you will stay till tomorrow? Why, yes, you know that was the agreement. All right, my dear, I just wanted to know. 
Wait for me here a minute, I will be right back. And she left me in the darkness. I heard her shutting two doors, and I thought I heard her talking. I was surprised and uneasy. The thought that she had a protector staggered me, but I have good fists and a solid back. We shall see, I said to myself. I listened attentively with ear in mind. Someone was stirring about, walking quietly and very carefully. Then another door opened, and I thought I again heard someone talking, but in a very low tone. She came back carrying a lighted candle. You may come in, she said. She said thou in speaking to me, which was an indication of possession. I went in, and after passing through a dining room in which it was very evident that no one ever ate, I entered a typical room of all these women, a furnished room with red curtains and a soiled eider-down bed covering. Make yourself at home, mon chat, she said. I gave a suspicious glance at the room, but there seemed no reason for uneasiness. As she took off her wrap, she began to laugh. Well, what ails you? Are you changed into a pillar of salt? Come, hurry up. I did as she suggested. Five minutes later, I longed to put on my things and get away, but this terrible languor that had overcome me at home took possession of me again, and deprived me of energy enough to move, and I stayed in spite of the disgust that I felt for this association. The unusual attractiveness that I supposed I had discovered in this creature, over there under the chandeliers of the theatre, had altogether vanished on closer acquaintance, and she was nothing more to me now than a common woman, like all the others, whose indifferent and complacent kiss smacked of garlic. I thought I would say something. Have you lived here long? I asked. Over six months on the 15th of January. Where were you before that? In the Rue Clozelle, but the janitor made me very uncomfortable and I left. And she began to tell me an interminable story of a janitor who'd talked scandal about her. But suddenly I heard something quite close to us. First there was a sigh, then a slight but distinct sound as if someone had turned round on a chair. I sat up abruptly and asked, what was that noise? She answered quietly and confidently. Don't be uneasy, my dear boy. It is my neighbor. The partition is so thin that one can hear everything as if it were in the room. These are wretched rooms, just like pasteboard. I felt so lazy that I paid no further attention to it. We resumed our conversation. Driven by the stupid curiosity that prompts all men to question these creatures about their first experiences, to attempt to lift the veil of their first folly, as though to find in them a trace of pristine innocence, to love them, possibly, in a fleeting memory of their candor and modesty of former days, evoked by a word, I insistently asked her about her earlier lovers. I knew she was telling me lies. What did it matter? Among all these lies, I might, perhaps, discover something sincere and pathetic. Come, said I, tell me who he was. He was a boating man, my dear. Ah, tell me about it. Where were you? I was at Argentuil. What were you doing? I was a waitress in a restaurant. What restaurant? The Freshwater Sailor. Do you know it? I should say so. Kept by Bon Fan? Yes, that's it. And how did he make love to you, this boating man? While I was doing his room, he took advantage of me. But I suddenly recalled the theory of a friend of mine, an observant and philosophical physician, whom constant attendance in hospitals has brought into daily contact with girl mothers and prostitutes, with all the shame and all the misery of women, of these poor women who have become the frightful prey of the wandering male with money in his pocket. A woman, he said, is always debauched by a man of her own class and position. I have volumes of statistics on that subject. We accuse the rich of plucking the flower of innocence among the girls of the people. That is not correct. The rich pay for what they want. They may gather some, but never for the first time. Then, turning to my companion, I began to laugh. You know that I am aware of your history. The boating man was not the first. Oh, yes, my dear, I swear it. You are lying, my dear. Oh, no, I assure you. You are lying. Come on, tell me all. She seemed to hesitate in astonishment. I continued. I am a sorcerer, my dear girl. I am a clairvoyant. If you do not tell me the truth, I will go into a trance sleep and I can find out. She was afraid, being as stupid as all her kind. She faltered. How did you guess? Come, go on telling me, I said. Oh, the first time didn't amount to anything. There was a festival in the country. They had sent for a special chef, Monsieur Alexandre. As soon as he came, he did just as he pleased in the house. He bossed everyone, even the proprietor and his wife, as if he had been a king. He was a big, handsome man who did not seem fitted to stand beside a kitchen range. He was always calling out, Come, some butter, some eggs, some Madeira. And it had to be brought to him at once in a hurry, or he would get cross and say things that would make us blush all over. When the day was over, he would smoke a pipe outside the door. And as I was passing by him with a pile of plates, he said to me, like that, Come, girly, come down to the water with me and show me the country. I went with him like a fool, and we had hardly got down to the bank of the river when he took advantage of me so suddenly that I did not even know what he was doing. And then he went away on the nine o'clock train. I never saw him again. Is that all? I asked. She hesitated. Oh, I think Florentin belongs to him. Who is Florentin? My little boy. Oh, 
Well, then, you made the boating man believe that he was the father, did you not? You bet. Did he have any money, this boating man? Yes, he left me an income of three hundred francs, settled on Florentin. I was beginning to be amused, and resumed. All right, my girl, all right. You are all of you less stupid than one would imagine, all the same. And how old is he now, Florentin? She replied, He is now twelve. He will make his first communion in the spring. That is splendid. And since then you have carried on your business conscientiously? She sighed in a resigned manner. I must do what I can. But a loud noise just then coming from the room itself made me start up with a bound. It sounded like someone falling and picking themselves up again by feeling along the wall with their hands. I had seized the candle and was looking about me, terrified and furious. She had also risen and was trying to hold me back to stop me, murmuring, That's nothing, my dear. I assure you it's nothing. But I had discovered what direction the strange noise came from. I walked straight towards a door hidden at the head of the bed, and I opened it abruptly and saw before me, trembling, his bright, terrified eyes opened wide at sight of me, a little pale, thin boy seated beside a wicker chair off which he had fallen. As soon as he saw me, he began to cry. Stretching his arms to his mother, he cried, "'It was not my fault, Mama. it was not my fault. I was asleep and I fell off. Do not scold me. It was not my fault.' I turned to the woman and said, "'What does this mean?' She seemed confused and worried, and said in a broken voice, "'What do you want me to do? I do not earn enough to put him through school. I have to keep him with me, and I cannot afford to pay for another room, by heavens. He sleeps with me when I am alone. If anyone comes for one hour or two, he can stay in the wardrobe. He keeps quiet, he understands it. But when people stay all night, as you have done, it tires the poor child to sleep on a chair. It is not his fault. I should like to see you sleep all night on a chair. You would have nothing to say. She was getting angry and excited and was talking loud. The child was still crying. A poor, delicate, timid little fellow, a veritable child of the wardrobe, of the cold, dark closet, a child who from time to time was allowed to get a little warmth in the bed if it chanced to be unoccupied. I also felt inclined to cry, and I went home to my own bed. End of section 179. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 180 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 180. The Mountain Pool. St. Agnes, May 6th. My dear friend, you ask me to write to you often and to tell you in particular about the things I might see. You also beg me to rummage among my recollections of travels for some of those little anecdotes gathered from a chance peasant, from an innkeeper, from some strange traveling acquaintance, which remain as landmarks in the memory. With a landscape depicted in a few lines and a little story told in a few sentences, you think one can give the true characteristics of a country, make it living, visible, dramatic. I will try to do as you wish. I will, therefore, send you from time to time letters in which I will mention neither you nor myself, but only the landscape and the people who move about in it. And now I will begin. Spring is a season in which one ought, it seems to me, to drink and eat the landscape. It is the season of chills, just as autumn is a season of reflection. In spring the country rouses the physical senses, in autumn it enters into the soul. I desired this year to breathe the odor of orange blossoms, and I set out for the south of France just at that time that everyone else was returning home. I visited Monaco, the shrine of pilgrims, rival of Mecca and Jerusalem, without leaving any gold in anyone's pockets, and I climbed the high mountain beneath a covering of lemon, orange, and olive branches. Have you ever slept, my friend, in a grove of orange trees and flower? The air that one inhales with delight is a quintessence of perfumes. The strong yet sweet odor, delicious as some dainty, seems to blend with our being, to saturate us, to intoxicate us, to enervate us, to plunge us into a sleepy, dreamy torpor as though it were an opium prepared by the hands of fairies, and not at those of druggists. This is a country of ravines. The surface of the mountains is cleft, hollowed out in all directions, and in those sinuous crevices grow veritable forests of lemon trees. Here and there, where the steep gorge is interrupted by a sort of step, a kind of reservoir has been built which holds the water of the rainstorms. They are large holes with slippery walls, with nothing for anyone to grasp hold of should they fall in. I was walking slowly in one of these ascending valleys or gorges, glancing through the foliage at the vivid-hued fruit that remained on the branches. The narrow gorge made the heavy odor of the flowers still more penetrating. The air seemed to be dense with it. A feeling of lassitude came over me, and I looked for a place to sit down. A few drops of water glistened in the grass. I thought that there was a spring nearby, and I climbed a little further to look for it, but I only reached the edge of one of these large, deep reservoirs. I sat down tailor-fashion with my legs crossed under me, and remained there in a reverie before this hole, 
which looked as if it were filled with ink, so black and stagnant was the liquid it contained. Down yonder through the branches, I saw like patches, bits of the Mediterranean gleaming, so that they fairly dazzled my eyes. But my glance always returned to the immense somber well that appeared to be inhabited by no aquatic animals, so motionless was its surface. Suddenly a voice made me tremble. An old gentleman who was picking flowers, this country is the richest in Europe for herbalists, asked me, Are you a relation of those poor children, monsieur? I looked at him in astonishment. What children, monsieur? He seemed embarrassed and answered with a bow. I beg your pardon. On seeing you sitting thus absorbed in front of this reservoir, I thought you were recalling the frightful tragedy that occurred here. Now I wanted to hear about it, and I begged him to tell me the story. It is very dismal and very heartrending, my dear friend, and very trivial at the same time. It is a simple news item. I do not know whether to attribute my emotion to the dramatic manner in which the story was told to me, to the setting of the mountains, to the contrast between the joy of the sunlight and the flowers and this black, murderous hole, but my heart was wrung. All my nerves unstrung by this tale, which, perhaps, may not appear so terribly harrowing to you as you read it in your room, without having the scene of the tragedy before your eyes. It was one spring in recent years. Two little boys frequently came to play on the edge of the cistern while their tutor lay under a tree reading a book. One warm afternoon, a piercing cry awoke the tutor, who was dozing, and the sound of splashing caused by something falling into the water made him jump to his feet abruptly. The younger of the children, eight years of age, was shouting, as he stood beside the reservoir, the surface of which was stirred and eddying at the spot where the older boy had fallen in as he ran along the stone coping. Distracted, without waiting or stopping to think what was best to do, the tutor jumped in the black water and did not rise again, having struck his head at the bottom of the cistern. At the same moment, the young boy who had risen to the surface was waving his stretched-out arms toward his brother. The little fellow on land lay down full length while the other tried to swim, to approach the wall and presently the four little hands clasped each other, tightened in each other's grasp, contracted as though they were fastened together. They both felt the intense joy of an escape from death, a shudder at the danger past. The older boy tried to climb up to the edge but could not manage it, as the wall was perpendicular, and his brother, who was too weak, was sliding slowly towards the hole. They remained motionless, filled anew with terror, and they waited. The little fellow squeezed his brother's hands with all his might and wept from nervousness as he repeated, I cannot drag you out! I cannot drag you out! And all at once he began to shout, Help! Help! But his light voice scarcely penetrated beyond the dome of foliage above their heads. They remained thus a long time, hours and hours, facing each other, these two children, with one thought, one anguish of heart, and the horrible dread that one of them, exhausted, might let go of the hands of the other. And they kept calling, but all in vain. At length the older brother, who was shivering with cold, said to the little one, I cannot hold out any longer. I am going to fall. Goodbye, little brother. And the other, gasping, replied, Not yet, not yet, wait! Evening came on, the still evening with its stars mirrored in the water. The older lad, his endurance giving out, said, Let go my hand, I am going to give you my watch. He had received it as a present a few days before, and ever since it had been his chief amusement. He was able to get hold of it, and held it out to the little fellow who was sobbing, and laid it down on the grass beside him. It was night now. The two unhappy beings, exhausted, had almost loosened their grasp. The elder, at last, feeling that he was lost, murmured once more, "'Goodbye, little brother. Kiss Mama and Papa,' and his numbed fingers relaxed their hold. He sank and did not rise again. The little fellow, left alone, began to shout wildly, "'Paul! Paul!' But the other did not come to the surface. Then he darted across the mountain, falling among the stones, overcome by the most frightful anguish that can wring a child's heart, and with a face like death reached the sitting-room where his parents were waiting. He became bewildered again as he led them to the gloomy reservoir. He could not find his way. At last he reached the spot. It is there, yes, it is there. But the cistern had to be emptied, and the proprietor would not permit it as he needed the water for his lemon trees. The two bodies were found, however, but not until the next day. You see, my dear friend, that this is a simple news item. But if you had seen the hole itself, your heart would have been wrung, as mine was, at the thought of the agony of that child hanging to his brother's hands, of the long suspense of those little chaps who were accustomed only to laugh and play, and at the simple incident of the giving of the watch. I said to myself, My fate preserved me from ever receiving a similar relic. I know of nothing more terrible than such a recollection connected with a familiar object that one cannot dispose of. Only think of it. Each time that he handles the sacred watch, the survivor will picture once more the horrible scene. The pool, the wall, the still water, and the distracted face of his brother, alive, yet as lost as if he were already dead. And all through his life, at any moment, the vision will be there, awakened the instant even the tip of his finger touches his watch pocket. And I was sad until evening. 
I left the spot and kept on climbing, leaving the region of orange trees for the region of olive trees, and the region of olive trees for the region of pines. Then I came across a valley of stones, and finally reached the ruins of an ancient castle, built, they say, in the tenth century by a Saracen chief, a good man who was baptized a Christian through love for a young girl. Everywhere around me were mountains, and before me the sea, the sea with an almost imperceptible patch on it, Corsica, or rather, the shadow of Corsica. But on the mountain summits, blood red in the glow of the sunset, in the boundless sky and on the sea, in all this superb landscape that I had come here to admire, I saw only two poor children, one lying prone on the edge of a hole filled with black water, the other submerged to his neck, their hands intertwined, weeping opposite one another in despair. And it seemed as though I continually heard a weak, exhausted voice saying, "'Goodbye, little brother. I'm going to give you my watch.' This letter may seem rather melancholy, dear friend. I will try to be more cheerful some other day. End of section 180. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 181 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 181. A Cremation. Last Monday, an Indian prince died at Etretat, Babu Sahib Kanderao Gate, a relation of His Highness, the Maharaja Gekwar, Prince of Baroda, in the province of Gujarat, Presidency of Bombay. For about three weeks, there had been seen walking in the streets about ten young East Indians, small, lithe, with dark skins, dressed all in gray and wearing on their heads caps such as English grooms wear. They were men of high rank who had come to Europe to study the military institutions of the principal Western nations. The little band consisted of three princes, a nobleman, an interpreter, and three servants. The head of the commission had just died, an old man of forty-two and father-in-law of San Patro Cachival Gacquar, brother of His Highness, the Gacquar of Baroda. The son-in-law accompanied his father-in-law. The other East Indians were called Ganpatro Chavaranrao Gacquar, cousin of His Highness Cacharao Gadav, Vasudev Madav Samarth, interpreter and secretary, and the slaves, Ramchandra Bajaji, Ganu bin Pukiram Kukate, Rampaji bin Febji. On leaving his native land, the one who died recently was overcome with terrible grief, and feeling convinced that he would never return, he wished to give up the journey, but he had to obey the wishes of his noble relative, the Prince of Baroda, and he set out. They came to spend the latter part of the summer at Etretat, and people would go out of curiosity every morning to see them taking their bath at the Etablissement de Roche Blanche. Five or six days ago, Bapu Sahib Kanderaogate was taken with pains in his gums, then the inflammation spread to his throat and became ulceration. Gangrene set in, and, on Monday, the doctors told his young friends that their relative was dying. The final struggle was already beginning, and the breath had almost left the unfortunate man's body when his friend seized him, snatched him up from his bed, and laid him on the stone floor of the room, so that, stretched out on the earth, our mother, he should yield up his soul, according to the command of Brahma. They then sent to ask the mayor, Monsieur Boisset, for a permit to burn the body that very day so as to fulfill the prescribed ceremonial of the Hindu religion. The mayor hesitated, telegraphed to the prefecture to demand instructions, at the same time sending word that failure to reply would be considered by him tantamount to consent. As he had received no reply at nine o'clock that evening, he decided, in view of the infectious character of the disease of which the East Indian had died, that the cremation of the body should take place that very night, beneath the cliff, on the beach, at ebb tide. The mayor is being criticized now for this decision, though he acted as an intelligent, liberal, and determined man, and was upheld and advised by three physicians who had watched the case and reported the death. They were dancing at the casino that evening. It was an early autumn evening, rather chilly. A pretty strong wind was blowing from the ocean, although as yet there was no sea on, and no swift, light, ragged clouds driving across the sky. They came from the edge of the horizon, looking dark against the background of the sky, but as they approached the moon they grew whiter and passed hurriedly across her face, veiling it for a few seconds without completely hiding it. The tall straight cliffs that enclose the rounded beach of Etretat and terminate in two celebrated arches, called the Gates, lay in shadow and made two great black patches in the softly lighted landscape. It had rained all day. The casino orchestra was playing waltzes, polkas, and quadrilles. A rumor was presently circulating among the groups of dancers. It said that an East Indian prince had just died at the Hotel de Bain, and that the ministry had been approached for permission to burn the body. No one believed it, or at least no one supposed that such a thing could occur, so foreign was the custom, as yet to our customs, and as the night was far advanced, everyone went home. At midnight, the lamplighter, running from street to street, extinguished one after another the yellow jets of flame that lighted up the sleeping houses, the mud, and the puddles of water. 
We waited, watching for the hour when the little town would be quiet and deserted. Ever since noon, a carpenter had been cutting up wood and asking himself with amazement what was going to be done with all these planks sawn up into little bits, and why one should destroy so much good merchandise. This wood was piled up in a cart, which went along through side streets as far as the beach, without arousing the suspicion of belated persons who might meet it. It went along on the shingle at the foot of the cliff, and having dumped its contents on the beach, the three Indian servants began to build a funeral pile, a little longer than it was wide. They worked alone, for no profane hand must aid in this solemn duty. It was one o'clock in the morning when the relations of the deceased were informed that they might accomplish their part of the work. The door of the little house they occupied was open, and we perceived, lying on a stretcher in the small, dimly lighted vestibule, the corpse covered with white silk. We could see him plainly as he lay stretched out on his back, his outline clearly defined beneath his white veil. The East Indians, standing at his feet, remained motionless, while one of them performed the prescribed rites, murmuring unfamiliar words in a low, monotonous tone. He walked round and round the corpse, touching it occasionally. Then, taking an urn suspended from three slender chains, he sprinkled it for some time with the sacred water of the Ganges that East Indians must always carry with them wherever they go. Then the stretcher was lifted by four of them who started off at a slow march. The moon had gone down, leaving the muddy, deserted streets in darkness, but the body on the stretcher appeared to be luminous, so dazzlingly white was the silk, and it was a weird sight to see, passing along through the night, the semi-luminous form of this corpse borne by these men, the dusky skin of whose faces and hands could hardly be distinguished from their clothing in the darkness. Behind the corpse came three Indians, and then, a full head taller than themselves and wrapped in an ample traveling coat of a soft gray color, appeared the outline of an Englishman, a kind and superior man, a friend of theirs, who was their guide and counselor in their European travels. Beneath the cold, misty sky of this little northern beach, I felt as if I were taking part in a sort of symbolical drama. It seemed to me that they were carrying there, before me, the conquered genius of India, followed, as in a funeral procession, by the victorious genius of England robed in grey ulster. On the shingly beach the four bearers halted in a few moments to take breath, and then proceeded on their way. They now walked quickly, bending beneath the weight of their burden. At length they reached the funeral pile. It was erected in an indentation at the very foot of the cliff, which rose above it perpendicularly a hundred meters high, perfectly white but looking grey in the night. The funeral pile was about three and a half feet high. The corpse was placed on it, and then one of the Indians asked to have the pole star pointed out to him. This was done, and the dead Raja was laid with his feet turned toward his native country. Then twelve bottles of kerosene were poured over him, and he was covered completely with thin slabs of pine wood. For almost another hour, the relations and servants kept piling up the funeral pyre, which looked like one of those piles of wood that carpenters keep in their yards. Then on top of this was poured the contents of twenty bottles of oil, and on top of all they emptied a bag of fine shavings. A few steps further on, a flame was glimmering in a little bronze brazier, which had remained lighted since the arrival of the corpse. The moment had arrived. The relations went to fetch the fire. As it was barely a light, some oil was poured on it, and suddenly a flame arose, lighting up the great wall of rock from summit to base. An Indian who was leaning over the brazier rose upright, his two hands in the air, elbows bent, and all at once we saw arising, all black on the immense white cliff, a colossal shadow, the shadow of Buddha in his hieratic posture, and the little pointed toque that the man wore on his head even looked like the headdress of the god. The effect was so striking and unexpected that I felt my heart beat as though some supernatural apparition had risen up before me. That was just what it was, the ancient and sacred image come from the heart of the East to the ends of Europe, and watching over its son whom they were going to cremate there. It vanished. They brought fire. The shavings on top of the pyre were lighted, and then the wood caught fire, and a brilliant light illuminated the cliff, the shingle, and the foam of the waves as they broke on the beach. It grew brighter from second to second, lighting up on the sea in the distance the dancing crest of the waves. The breeze from the ocean blew in gusts, increasing the heat of the flame which flattened down, twisted, then shot up again, throwing out millions of sparks. They mounted with wild rapidity along the cliff and were lost in the sky, mingling with the stars, increasing their number. Some seabirds who had awakened uttered their plaintive cry, and, describing long curves, flew with their white wings extended through the gleam from the funeral pyre and then disappeared in the night. Before long the pile of wood was nothing but a mass of flame, not red but yellow, a blinding yellow, a furnace lashed by the wind, and suddenly, beneath a stronger gust, it tottered, partially crumbling as it leaned toward the sea, and the corpse came into view, full length, blackened on his couch of flame and burning with the long blue flames. The pile of wood having crumbled further on the right, the corpse turned over as a man does in bed. They immediately covered him with fresh wood, and the fire started up again more furiously than ever. The East Indians, seated in a semicircle on the shingle, looked out with sad, serious faces, and to the rest of us, as it was very cold, 
We had drawn nearer to the fire until the smoke and sparks came in our faces. There was no odor save that of burning pine and petroleum. Hours passed. Day began to break. Toward five o'clock in the morning, nothing remained but a heap of ashes. The relations gathered them up, cast some of them to the winds, some in the sea, and kept some in a brass vase that they had brought from India. Then they retired to their home to give utterance to lamentations. These young princes and their servants, by the employment of the most inadequate appliances, succeeded in carrying out the cremation of their relation in the most perfect manner, with singular skill and remarkable dignity. Everything was done according to ritual, according to the rigid ordinances of their religion. Their dead one rests in peace. The following morning at daybreak, there was an indescribable commotion in Etretat. Some insisted that they had burned a man alive, others that they were trying to hide a crime, some that the mayor would be put in jail, others that the Indian prince had succumbed to an attack of cholera. The men were amazed, the women indignant. A crowd of people spent the day on the site of the funeral pile, looking for fragments of bone in the shingle that was still warm. They found enough bones to reconstruct ten skeletons, for the farmers of the shore frequently throw their dead sheep into the sea. The finders carefully place these various fragments in their pocketbooks, but not one of them possesses a true particle of the Indian prince. That very night, a deputy sent by the government came to hold an inquest. He, however, formed an estimate of this singular case like a man of intelligence and good sense. But what should he say in his report? The East Indians declared that if they had been prevented in France from cremating their dead, they would have taken him to a freer country where they could carry out their customs. Thus, I have seen a man cremated on a funeral pile, and it has now given me a wish to disappear in the same manner. In this way, everything ends at once. Man expedites the slow work of nature instead of delaying it by the hideous coffin in which one decomposes for months. The flesh is dead, the spirit has fled. Fire which purifies disperses in a few hours all that was a human being. It casts it to the winds, converting it to air and ashes, and not into ignominious corruption. This is clean and hygienic. Putrefaction beneath the ground in a closed box where the body becomes like pap, a blackened, stinking pap, has about it something repugnant and disgusting. The sight of the coffin as it descends into this muddy hole wrings one's heart with anguish. But the funeral pyre, which flames up beneath the sky, has about it something grand, beautiful, and solemn. End of section 181. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 182 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 182. Misty. I was very much interested at that time in a droll little woman. She was married, of course, as I have a horror of unmarried flirts. What enjoyment is there in making love to a woman who belongs to nobody and yet belongs to anyone? And besides, morality aside, I do not understand love as a trade. That disgusts me somewhat. The especial attraction in a married woman to a bachelor is that she gives him a home, a sweet, pleasant home where everyone takes care of you and spoils you, from the husband to the servants. One finds everything combined there, love, friendship, even fatherly interest, bed and board, all, in fact, that constitute the happiness of life, with this incalculable advantage, that one can change one's family from time to time, take up one's abode in all kinds of society in turn, in summer, in the country, with the workman who rents you a home in his house, in winter with the townsfolk, or even with the nobility, if one is ambitious. I have another weakness. It is that I become attached to the husband as well as the wife. I acknowledge even that some husbands, ordinary or coarse as they may be, give me a feeling of disgust for their wives, however charming they may be. But when the husband is intellectual or charming, I invariably become very much attached to him. I am careful if I quarrel with the wife not to quarrel with the husband. In this way, I have made some of my best friends, and I have also proved in many cases the incontestable superiority of the male over the female of the human species. The latter makes all sorts of trouble scenes, reproaches, etc., while the former, who has just as good a right to complain, treats you, on the contrary, as though you were a special providence of his hearth. Well, my friend was a quaint little woman, a brunette, fanciful, capricious, pious, superstitious, credulous as a monk, but charming. She had a way of kissing one that I never saw in anyone else, but that was not the attraction, and such a soft skin. It gave me intense delight merely to hold her hands, and an eye, her glance was like a slow caress, delicious and unending. Sometimes I would lean my head on her knee, and we would remain motionless, she leaning over me with that subtle, enigmatic, disturbing smile that women have, while my eyes would be raised to hers, drinking sweetly and deliciously into my heart, like a form of intoxication. The glance of her limpid blue eyes, limpid as though they were full of thoughts of love, and blue as though they were a heaven of delights. 
Her husband, inspector of some large public works, was frequently away from home and left us our evenings free. Sometimes I spent them with her lounging on the divan with my forehead on one of her knees, while on the other lay an enormous black cat called Misty, whom she adored. Our fingers would meet on the cat's back and would intertwine in her soft, silky fur. I felt its warm body against my cheek, trembling with its eternal purring, and occasionally a paw would reach out and place on my mouth, or my eyelid, five unsheathed claws which would prick my eyelids, and then be immediately withdrawn. Sometimes we would go out on what we called our escapades. They were very innocent, however. They consisted in taking supper at some inn in the suburbs, or else, after dining at her house or at mine, in making the round of the cheap cafes, like students out for a lark. We would go into the common drinking places and take our seats at the end of the smoky den on two rickety chairs at an old wooden table. A cloud of pungent smoke, with which blended an odor of fried fish from dinner, filled the room. Men in smocks were talking in loud tones as they drank their petit verre, and the astonished waiter placed before us two cherry brandies. She, tremblingly afraid, would raise her double black veil as far as her nose, and then take her glass with the enjoyment that one feels at doing something delightfully naughty. Each cherry she swallowed made her feel as if she had done something wrong. Each swallow of the burning liquor had on her the effect of a delicate and forbidden enjoyment. Then she would say to me in a low tone, Let us go. And we would leave, she walking quickly with lowered head between the drinkers who watched her going by with a look of displeasure. And as soon as we got into the street, she would give a great sigh of relief, as if we had escaped some terrible danger. Sometimes she would ask me with a shudder, Suppose they should say something rude to me in those places, what would you do? Why, I would defend you, parbleu, I would reply in a resolute manner. And she would squeeze my arm for happiness, perhaps with a vague wish that she might be insulted and protected, that she might see men fight on her account, even those men with me. One evening, as we sat at a table in a tavern at Montmartre, we saw an old woman in tattered garments come in, holding in her hand a pack of dirty cards. Perceiving a lady, the old woman at once approached us and offered to tell my friend's fortune. Emma, who in her heart believed in everything, was trembling with longing and anxiety, and she made a place beside her for the old woman. The latter, old, wrinkled, her eyes with red inflamed rings around them, and her mouth without a single tooth in it, began to deal her dirty cards on the table. She dealt them in piles, then gathered them up, and then dealt them out again, murmuring indistinguishable words. Emma, turning pale, listened with bated breath, gasping with anxiety and curiosity. The fortune teller broke silence. She predicted vague happenings, happiness in children, a fair young man, a voyage, money, a lawsuit, a dark man, the return of someone, a success, a death. The mention of this death attracted the younger woman's attention. Whose death? When? In what manner? The old woman replied, Oh, as to that, these cards are not certain enough. You must come to my place tomorrow. I will tell you about it with coffee grounds, which never make a mistake. Emma turned anxiously to me. Say, let us go there tomorrow. Oh, please say yes. If not, you can't imagine how worried I'll be. I began to laugh. We'll go if you wish it, dearie. The old woman gave us her address. She lived on the sixth floor in a wretched house behind the Butte Chamont. We went there the following day. Her room, an attic containing two chairs and a bed, was filled with strange objects, bunches of herbs hanging from nails, skins of animals, flasks and vials containing liquids of various colors. On the table, a stuffed black cat looked out of eyes of glass. He seemed like the demon of this sinister dwelling. Emma, almost fainting with emotion, sat down on a chair and exclaimed, "'Oh dear, look at that cat! How like it is to Misty!' And she explained to the old woman that she had a cat exactly like that one. The old woman replied gravely, if you are in love with a man, you must not keep it. Emma, suddenly filled with fear, asked, Why not? The old woman sat down familiarly beside her and took her hand. It was the undoing of my life, she said. My friend wanted to hear about it. She leaned against the old woman, questioned her, begged her to tell. At length, the woman agreed to do so. I loved that cat, she said, as one would love a brother. I was young then and all alone, a seamstress. I had only him, Mouton. One of the tenants had given it to me. He was as intelligent as a child, and gentle as well, and he worshipped me, my dear lady. He worshipped me more than one does a fetish. All day long he would sit on my lap purring, and all night long on my pillow. I could feel his heart beating, in fact. Well, I happened to make an acquaintance, a fine young man who was working in a white goods house. That went on for about three months, on a footing of mere friendship. But, you know, one is liable to weaken, it may happen to anyone, and besides, I had really begun to love him. He was so nice, so nice and so good. He wanted us to live together for economy's sake. I finally allowed him to come and see me one evening. I had not made up my mind to anything definite, oh no, but I was pleased at the idea that we should spend an hour together. At first he behaved very well, said nice things to me that made my heart go pit-a-pat, 
And then he kissed me, madame, kissed me as one does when they love. I remained motionless, my eyes closed in a paroxysm of happiness. But suddenly I felt him start violently, and he gave a scream, a scream that I shall never forget. I opened my eyes and saw that Mouton had sprung at his face and was tearing the skin with his claws as if it had been a linen rag, and the blood was streaming down like rain, madame. I tried to take the cat away, but he held on tight, scratching all the time, and bit me. He was so crazy. I finally got him and threw him out of the window, which was open, for it was summer. When I began to bathe my poor friend's face, I noticed that his eyes were destroyed, both his eyes. He had to go to the hospital. He died of grief at the end of a year. I wanted to keep him with me and provide for him, but he would not agree to it. One would have supposed that he hated me after the occurrence. As for Mouton, his back was broken by the fall. The janitor picked up his body. I had him stuffed, for in spite of all I was fond of him. If he acted as he did, it was because he loved me, was it not? The old woman was silent and began to stroke the lifeless animal whose body trembled on its iron framework. Emma, with sorrowful heart, had forgotten about the predicted death. Or at least she did not allude to it again, and she left, giving the woman five francs. As her husband was to return the following day, I did not go to the house for several days. When I did go, I was surprised at not seeing Misty. I asked where he was. She blushed and replied, I gave him away. I was uneasy. I was astonished. Uneasy? Uneasy? About what? She gave me a long kiss and said in a low tone, I was uneasy about your eyes, my dear. End of section 182. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 183 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 183. Madame Hermé. Crazy people attract me. They live in a mysterious land of weird dreams, in that impenetrable cloud of dementia where all that they have witnessed in their previous life, all they have loved, is reproduced for them in an imaginary existence, outside of all laws that govern the things of this life and control human thought. For them there is no such thing as the impossible. Nothing is improbable. Fairyland is a constant quantity and the supernatural quite familiar. The old rampart, logic, the old wall, reason, the old mainstay of thought, good sense, break down, fall and crumble before their imagination, set free and escaped into the limitless realm of fancy, and advancing with fabulous bounds, and nothing can ever check it. For them, everything happens, and anything may happen. They make no effort to conquer events, to overcome resistance, to overturn obstacles. By a sudden caprice of their flighty imagination, they become princes, emperors, or gods, are possessed of all the wealth of the world, all the delightful things of life, enjoy all pleasures, are always strong, always beautiful, always young, always loved. They alone can be happy in this world, for, as far as they are concerned, reality does not exist. I love to look into their wandering intelligence as one leans over an abyss at the bottom of which seethes a foaming torrent whose source and destination are both unknown. But it is in vain that we lean over these abysses, for we shall never discover the source nor the destination of this water. After all, it is only water just like what is flowing in the sunlight, and we shall learn nothing by looking at it. It is likewise of no use to ponder over the intelligence of crazy people, for their most weird notions are, in fact, only ideas that are already known, which appear strange simply because they are no longer under the restraint of reason. Their whimsical source surprises us because we do not see it bubbling up. Doubtless the dropping of a little stone into the current was sufficient to cause these ebullitions. Nevertheless, crazy people attract me, and I always return to them, drawn in spite of myself by this trivial mystery of dementia. One day, as I was visiting one of the asylums, the physician who was my guide said, Come, I will show you an interesting case. And he opened the door of a cell where a woman of about forty, still handsome, was seated in a large armchair, looking persistently at her face in a little hand mirror. As soon as she saw us, she rose to her feet, ran to the other end of the room, picked up a veil that lay on a chair, wrapped it carefully round her face, and then came back, nodding her head in reply to our greeting. Well, said the doctor, how are you this morning? She gave a deep sigh. Oh, ill, monsieur, very ill. The marks are increasing every day. He replied in a tone of conviction. Oh, no, oh, no, I assure you that you are mistaken. She drew near to him and murmured. No, I am certain of it. I counted ten pittings this morning, three on the right cheek, four on the left cheek, and three on the forehead. It is frightful, frightful. I shall never dare to let anyone see me, not even my son. No, not even him. I am lost. I am disfigured forever. She fell back in her armchair and began to sob. The doctor took a chair, sat down beside her, and said soothingly in a gentle tone, 
Come, let me see. I assure you it is nothing. With a slight cauterization, I will make it all disappear. She shook her head in denial without speaking. He tried to touch her veil, but she seized it with both hands so violently that her fingers went through it. He continued to reason with her and reassure her. Come, you know very well that I remove those horrid pits every time, and that there is no trace of them after I have treated them. If you do not let me see them, I cannot cure you. I do not mind your seeing them, she murmured, but I do not know that gentleman who is with you. He is a doctor also, who can give you better care than I can. She then allowed her face to be uncovered, but her dread, her emotion, and her shame at being seen brought a rosy flush to her face and her neck, down to the collar of her dress. She cast down her eyes, turned her face aside, first to the right, then to the left, to avoid our gaze, and stammered out, Oh, it is torture to let myself be seen like this. It is horrible, is it not? Is it not horrible? I looked at her in much surprise, for there was nothing on her face. Not a mark, not a spot, not a sign of one, nor a scar. She turned towards me, her eyes still lowered, and said, It was while I was taking care of my son that I caught this fearful disease, monsieur. I saved him, but I am disfigured. I sacrificed my beauty to him, to my poor child. However, I did my duty. My conscience is at rest. If I suffer, it is known only to God. The doctor had drawn from his coat pocket a fine watercolor paintbrush. Let me attend to it, he said. I will put it all right. She held out her right cheek, and he began by touching it lightly with the brush here and there, as though he were putting little points of paint on it. He did the same with the left cheek, then with the chin and the forehead, and then exclaimed, See, there's nothing there now, nothing at all. She took up the mirror, gazed at her reflection with profound, eager attention, and with a strong mental effort to discover something, she sighed. No, it hardly shows at all. I am infinitely obliged to you. The doctor had risen. He bowed to her, ushered me out, and followed me, and, as soon as he had locked the door, he said, Here is the history of this unhappy woman. Her name is Madame Hermé. She was once very beautiful, a great coquette, very much beloved, and very much in love with life. She was one of those women who have nothing but their beauty and their love of admiration to sustain, guide, or comfort them in this life. The constant anxiety to retain her freshness, the care of her complexion, of her hands, her teeth, of every portion of body that was visible, occupied all her time and attention. She became a widow with one son. The boy was brought up as are all children of society beauties. She was, however, very fond of him. He grew up, and she grew older. Whether she saw the fatal crisis approaching, I cannot say. Did she, like so many others, gaze for hours and hours at her skin, once so fine, so transparent and free from blemish, now beginning to shrivel slightly, to be crossed with a thousand little lines, as yet imperceptible, that will grow deeper day by day, month by month? Did she also see slowly but surely increasing traces of those long wrinkles on the forehead, those slender serpents that nothing can check? Did she suffer the torture, the abominable torture of the mirror, the little mirror with the silver handle which one cannot make up one's mind to lay down on the table, but then throws down in disgust only to take it up again in order to look more closely, and still more closely at the hateful and insidious approaches of old age? Did she shut herself up ten times, twenty times a day, leaving her friends chatting in the drawing-room, and go up to her room, where, under the protection of bolts and bars, she would again contemplate the work of time on her ripe beauty, now beginning to wither, and recognize with despair the gradual process of age which no one has as yet seemed to perceive, but of which she herself was well aware. She knows where to seek the most serious, the gravest traces of age, and the mirror, the little round hand-glass in its carved silver frame, tells her horrible things, for it speaks, it seems to laugh, it jeers and tells her all that is going to occur, all the physical discomforts and the atrocious mental anguish she will suffer until the day of her death, which will be the day of her deliverance. Did she weep distractively on her knees, her forehead to the ground, and pray, pray, pray to him who thus slays his creatures and gives them youth, only that he may render old age more unendurable, and lends them beauty only that he withdraw it almost immediately? Did she pray to him, imploring him to do for her what he has never yet done for anyone, and let her retain until her last day her charm, her freshness, and her gracefulness? Then, finding that she was imploring in vain an unflexible unknown who drives on the years, one after another, did she roll on the carpet in her room, knocking her head against the furniture, and stifling in her throat shrieks of despair? Doubtless she suffered these tortures, for this is what occurred. One day, she was then thirty-five, her son, aged fifteen, fell ill. She took to his bed without anyone being able to determine the cause or nature of the illness. His tutor, a priest, watched beside him and hardly ever left him, while Madame Hermé came morning and evening to inquire how he was. 
She would come into the room in the morning in her night wrapper, smiling, all powdered and perfumed, and would ask as she entered the door, "'Well, George, are you better?' The big boy, his face red, swollen, and showing the ravages of fever, would reply, "'Yes, mother, a little better.' She would stay in the room a few seconds, look at the bottles of medicine, and purse her lips as if she were saying, "'Phew!' Then she would suddenly exclaim, "'Oh, I forgot something very important,' and would run out of the room, leaving behind her a fragrance of choice toilet perfumes. In the evening she would appear in a décolleté dress, in still a greater hurry, for she was always late, and she had just time to inquire, "'Well, what does the doctor say?' The priest would reply, "'He has not yet given an opinion, madame.' But one evening the abbé replied, "'Madame, your son has got the smallpox.' She uttered a scream of terror and fled the room. When her maid came to her room the following morning, she noticed at once a strong odor of burnt sugar, and she found her mistress with wide-open eyes, her face pale from lack of sleep, and shivering with terror in her bed. As soon as the shutters were open, Madame Hermé asked, "'How is George?' "'Oh, not at all well today, madame.' She did not rise until noon, when she ate two eggs with a cup of tea, as if she herself had been ill, and then she went out to a druggist to inquire about prophylactic measures against the contagion of smallpox. She did not come home until dinner time, laden with medicine bottles, and shut herself up at once in her room, where she saturated herself with disinfectants. The priest was waiting for her in the dining room. As soon as she saw him, she exclaimed in a voice full of emotion, Well? No improvement. The doctor is very anxious. The next day, as soon as it was light, she was sent to inquire for her son, but there was no improvement and she spent the whole day in her room, where little braziers were giving out pungent odors. Her maid said that you could also hear her sighing all the evening. She spent a whole week in this manner, only going out for an hour or two during the afternoon to breathe the air. She now sent to make inquiries every hour, and would sob when the reports were unfavorable. On the morning of the eleventh day, the priest, having been announced, entered her room, his face grave and pale, and said, without taking the chair she offered him, "'Madame, your son is very ill and wishes to see you.' She fell on her knees, exclaiming, "'Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I would never dare! My God! My God! Help me!' The priest continued, "'The doctor holds out little hope, madame, and George is expecting you.' And he left the room. Two hours later, as the young lad, feeling himself dying, again asked for his mother, the abbe went to her again and found her still on her knees, weeping and repeating, "'I will not! I will not! I am much too afraid! I will not!' He tried to persuade her, to strengthen her, to lead her. He only succeeded in bringing on an attack of nerves that lasted some time and caused her to shriek. The doctor, when he came in the evening, was told of this cowardice, and declared that he would bring her in himself, of her own volition or by force. But after trying all manner of argument, and just as he seized her round the waist to carry her into her son's room, she caught hold of the door and clung to it so firmly that they could not drag her away. Then when they let go of her, she fell at the feet of the doctor, begging his forgiveness and acknowledging that she was a wretched creature. And then she exclaimed, "'Oh, he's not going to die. Tell me that he is not going to die, I beg of you. Tell him that I love him and that I worship him.' The young lad was dying. Feeling that he had only a few moments to live, he entreated that his mother be persuaded to come and bid him a last farewell. With that sort of presentiment that the dying sometimes have, he had understood, had guessed all, and he said, if she is afraid to come into the room, beg her just to come to the balcony as far as my window so that I may see her, so that I may take a farewell look at her, as I cannot kiss her. The doctor and the abbe, once more, went together to this woman and assured her, You will run no risk, for there will be a pane of glass between you and him. She consented, covered up her head, and took with her a bottle of smelling salts. She took three steps on the balcony, then, all at once, hiding her face in her hands, she moaned, No, no, I would never dare look at him, never! I am too much ashamed, too much afraid. No, I cannot. They endeavored to drag her along, but she held on with both hands to the railings and uttered such plaints that the passers-by in the street raised their heads. And the dying boy waited, his eyes turned toward that window, waited to die until he could see for the last time that sweet, beloved face, the worshipped face of his mother. He waited long, and night came on. Then he turned over with his face to the wall and was silent. When day broke, he was dead. The day following, she was crazy. End of section 183. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 184 of Complete Original Short Stories of Guy de Maupassant. Translated by Albert C. McMaster, A. E. Henderson, and Louise Quesada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilva, Columbus, Ohio. Section 184, The Magic Couch. The sun flowed past my house without a ripple on its surface and gleaming in the bright morning sunlight. It was a beautiful, broad, indolent silver stream with crimson lights here and there, and on the opposite side of the river were rows of tall trees that covered all the bank with an immense wall of verdure. The sensation of life which is renewed each day, of fresh, happy, loving life trembled in the leaves, palpitated in the air, was mirrored in the water. The postman had just brought my papers, which were handed to me, and I walked slowly to the river bank in order to read them. In the first paper I opened, I noticed this headline, Statistics of Suicides, and I read that more than 8,500 persons had killed themselves in that year. In a moment I seemed to see them. I saw this voluntary and hideous massacre of the despairing who were weary of life. I saw men bleeding, their jaws fractured, their skulls cloven, their breasts pierced by a bullet, slowly dying, alone in a little room in a hotel, giving no thought to their wound, but thinking only of their misfortunes. I saw others seated before a tumbler in which some matches were soaking, or before a little bottle with a red label. They would look at it fixedly without moving, then they would drink and await the result, then a spasm would convulse their cheeks and draw their lips together, their eyes would grow wild with terror, for they did not know that the end would be preceded by so much suffering. They rose to their feet, paused, fell over, and with their hands pressed to their stomachs they felt their internal organs on fire, their entrails devoured by the fiery liquid, before their minds began to grow dim. I saw others hanging from a nail in the wall, from the fastening of the window, from a hook in the ceiling, from a beam in the garret, from a branch of a tree amid the evening rain, and I surmised all that had happened before they hung there motionless, their tongues hanging out of their mouths. I imagined the anguish of their heart, their final hesitation, their attempts to fasten the rope, to determine that it was secure, to then to pass a noose around their neck and let themselves fall. I saw others lying on wretched beds, mothers with their little children, old men dying of hunger, young girls dying for love, all rigid, suffocated, asphyxiated, while in the center of the room the brazier still gave forth the fumes of charcoal. And I saw others walking at night along the deserted bridges. These were the most sinister. The water flowed under the arches with a low sound. They did not see it. They guessed at it from its cool breath. They longed for it and they feared it. They dared not do it. And yet they must. A distant clock sounded the hour, and suddenly, in the vast silence of the night, there was heard the splash of a body falling into the river. A scream or two, the sound of hands beating the water, and all was still. Sometimes, even, there was only the sound of the falling body when they had tied their arms down or fastened a stone to their feet. Oh, the poor things. The poor things. How I felt their anguish. How I died in their death. I went through all their wretchedness, I endured in one hour all their tortures. I knew all the sorrows that had led them to this, for I know the deceitful infamy of life, and no one has felt it more than I have. How I understood them, these who, weak, harassed by misfortune, having lost those they loved, awakened from the dream of a tardy compensation, from the illusion of another existence where God will finally be just, after having been ferocious, and their minds disabused of the mirages of happiness, have given up the fight and desire to put an end to this ceaseless tragedy or this shameful comedy. Suicide. Why, it is the strength of those whose strength is exhausted, the hope of those who no longer believe, the sublime courage of the conquered. Yes, there is at least one door in this life we can always open and pass through to the other side. Nature had an impulse of pity. She did not shut us up in prison. Mercy for the despairing. As for those who are simply disillusioned, let them march ahead with free soul and quiet heart. They have nothing to fear since they may take their leave, for behind them there is always this door that the gods of our illusions cannot even lock. I thought of this crowd of suicides, more than 8,500 in one year, and it seemed to me that they had combined to send to the world a prayer, to utter a cry of appeal, to demand something that should come into effect later when we all understood things better. It seemed to me that all these victims, their throats cut, poisoned, hung, asphyxiated, drowned, all came together, a frightful horde like citizens to the poles, to say to society, Grant us at least a gentle death. Help us to die, you who will not help us to live. See, we are numerous. We have the right to speak in these days of freedom, of philosophic independence and of popular suffrage. Give to those who renounce life the charity of a death that will not be repugnant nor terrible. I began to dream, allowing my fancy to roam at will in weird and mysterious fashion on this subject. I seemed to be all at once in a beautiful city. It was Paris, but at what period? I walked about the streets, looking at the houses, the theaters, the public buildings, and presently found myself in a square where I remarked at a large building, very handsome, dainty, and attractive. I was surprised on reading on the façade the inscription of letters in gold, 
Suicide Bureau. Oh, the weirdness of waking dreams where the spirit soars into a world of unrealities and possibilities. Nothing astonishes one, nothing shocks one, and the unbridled fancy makes no distinction between the comic and the tragic. I approached the building where footmen in knee breeches were seated in the vestibule in front of a cloakroom, as they do at the entrance of a club. I entered out of curiosity. One of the men rose and said, What does monsieur wish? I wish to know what building this is. Nothing more? Why, no. Then would monsieur like me to take him to the secretary of the bureau? I hesitated and asked, But will that not disturb him? Oh, no, monsieur, he is here to receive those who desire information. Well, lead the way. He took me through corridors where old gentlemen were chatting, and finally led me into a beautiful office, somewhat somber, furnished throughout in black wood. A stout young man with a corporation was writing a letter as he smoked a cigar, the fragrance of which gave evidence of its quality. He rose. We bowed to each other, and as soon as the footman had retired, he asked, "'What can I do for you?' "'Monsieur,' I replied, "'pardon my curiosity. I had never seen this establishment. The few words inscribed on the façade filled me with astonishment, and I wanted to know what was going on here.' He smiled before replying, then said in a low tone with a complacent air, Mon dieu, monsieur, we put to death in a cleanly and gentle, I do not venture to say agreeable manner, those persons who desire to die. I did not feel very shocked, for it really seemed to me natural and right. What particularly surprised me was that on this planet, with its low utilitarian, humanitarian ideals, selfish and coercive of all true freedom, anyone should venture on a similar enterprise, worthy of an emancipated humanity. How did you get the idea? I asked. Monsieur, he replied, the number of suicides increased so enormously during the five years succeeding the World Exposition of 1889 that some measures were urgently needed. People killed themselves in the streets, at fets, in restaurants, at the theater, in railway carriages, at the receptions held by the President of the Republic, everywhere. It was not only a horrid sight for those who love life, as I do, but also a bad example for children. Hence it became necessary to centralize suicides. What caused this suicide epidemic? I do not know. The fact is, I believe, the world is growing old. People begin to see things clearly, and they are getting disgruntled. It is the same today with destiny as with the government. We have found out what it is. People find that they are swindled in every direction, and they just get out of it all. When one discovers that providence lies, cheats, robs, deceives human beings just as a plain deputy deceives his constituents, one gets angry. And as one cannot nominate a fresh providence every three months, as we do with our privileged representatives, one just gets out of the whole thing, which is decidedly bad. Really? Oh, as for me, I am not complaining. Will you inform me how you carry on this establishment? With pleasure. You may become a member when you please. It is a club. A club? Yes, monsieur. Founded by the most eminent men in the country. By men of the highest intellect and brightest intelligence. And, he added, laughing heartily, I swear to you that everyone gets a great deal of enjoyment out of it. In this place? Yes, in this place. You surprise me. Mon Dieu, they may enjoy themselves because they have not that fear of death, which is the great killjoy of all our earthly pleasures. But why should they be members of this club if they do not kill themselves? One may be a member of the club without being obliged for that reason to commit suicide. But then? I will explain. In view of the enormous increase in suicides and of the hideous spectacle they presented, a purely benevolent society was formed for the protection of those in despair, which placed at their disposal the facilities for a peaceful, painless, if not unforeseen death. Who could have authorized such an institution? General Boulanger, during his brief tenure of power, he could never refuse anything. However, that was the only good thing he did. Hence, a society was formed of clear-sighted, disillusioned skeptics who desired to erect in the heart of Paris a kind of temple dedicated to the contempt for death. This place was formerly a dreaded spot that no one ventured to approach. Then its founders, who met together here, gave a grand inaugural entertainment with Madame Sarah Bernhardt, Judic, Fio, Granier, and twenty others, and Madame de Resque, Coquelin, Mont Soulis, Paulus, etc., present, followed by concerts, the comedies of Dumas, of Milac, Hellevi and Sardon. We had only one thing to mar it, one drama by Beck which seemed sad, but which subsequently had great success at the Comédie Française. In fact, all Paris came. The enterprise was launched. In the midst of the festivities, what a funereal joke! Not at all. Death need not be sad, it should be a matter of indifference. We made death cheerful, crowned it with flowers, covered it with perfume, made it easy. One learns to aid others through example. One can see that it is nothing. 
I can well understand that they should come to the entertainments, but did they come to death? Not at first. They were afraid. And later? They came. Many of them. In crowds. We have had more than forty in a day. One finds hardly any more drowned bodies in the Seine. Who was the first? A club member. As a sacrifice to the cause? I don't think so. A man who was sick of everything, a down and out who had lost heavily at Baccarat for three months. Indeed. The second was an Englishman, an eccentric. We then advertised in the papers, we gave an account of our methods, we invented some attractive instances, but the great impetus was given by poor people. How do you go to work? Would you like to see? I can explain at the same time. Yes, indeed. He took his hat, opened the door, allowed me to precede him, and we entered a card room where men sat playing as they play in all gambling places. They were chatting cheerfully, eagerly. I have seldom seen such a jolly, lively, mirthful club. As I seemed surprised, the secretary said, Oh, the establishment has an unheard of prestige. All the smart people all over the world belong to it, so as to appear as though they held death in scorn. Then, once they get here, they feel obliged to be cheerful, so that they may not appear to be afraid. So they joke and laugh and talk flippantly. They are witty, and they become so. At present, it is certainly the most frequented and the most entertaining place in Paris. The women are even thinking of building an annex for themselves. And in spite of all this, you have how many suicides in the house? As I said, about forty or fifty a day. Society people are rare, but poor devils abound. The middle class has also a large contingent. And how... Do they do? They are asphyxiated very slowly. In what manner? A gas of our own invention. We have the patent. On the other side of the building are public entrances, three little doors opening on small streets. When a man or woman present themselves, they are interrogated. Then they are offered assurance, aid, and protection. If a client accepts, inquiries are made, and sometimes we have saved their lives. Where do you get your money? Oh, we have a great deal. There are a large number of shareholders. Besides, it is fashionable to contribute to the establishment. The names of the donors are published in Figaro. Then the suicide of every rich man costs a thousand francs, and they look as if they are lying in state. It costs the poor nothing. How can you tell who is poor? Oh, oh, monsieur, we can guess. And besides, they must bring a certificate of indigency from the commissary of police of their district. If you knew how distressing it is to see them come in, I visited their part of our building once only, and I will never go again. The place itself is almost as good as this part almost as luxurious and comfortable, but they themselves, they themselves, if you could see them arriving, the old men in rags coming to die, persons who have been dying of misery for months, picking up their food at the edges of the curbstone like dogs in the street, women in rags, sick, paralyzed, incapable of making a living, who say to us after they have told us their story, you see that things cannot go on like that, as I cannot work any longer or learn anything. I saw one woman of 87 who had lost all her children and grandchildren, and who for the last six weeks had been sleeping out of doors. It made me ill to hear of it. Then we have so many different cases, without counting those who say nothing, but simply ask, where is it? These are admitted at once, and it is all over in a minute. With a pang at my heart, I had repeated, and where is it? Here. And he opened a door, adding, go in. This is the part specifically reserved for club members, and the one least used. We have so far only had eleven annihilations in here. Ah, you call that an annihilation? Yes, monsieur, go in. I hesitated. At length I went in. It was a wide corridor, a sort of greenhouse in which panes of glass of pale blue, tender pink, and delicate green gave the poetic charm of landscapes to the enclosing walls. In this pretty salon there were divans, magnificent palms, flowers, especially roses of balmy fragrance, books on the tables, the Revue de Demande, cigars in government boxes, and, what surprised me, Vichy pastilles in bonbonniere. As I expressed my surprise, my guide said, Oh, they come often here to chat, he continued. The public corridors are similar, but more simply furnished. In reply to a question of mine, he pointed to a couch covered with creamy crepe de chine with white embroidery, beneath a large shrub of unknown variety, at the foot of which was a circular bed of mignot. The secretary added in a lower tone, we change the flower and the perfume at will, for our gas, which is quite imperceptible, gives death the fragrance of the suicide's favorite flower. It is volatilized with essences. Would you like to inhale it for a second? No, thank you, I said hastily. Not yet. He began to laugh. Oh, monsieur, there is no danger. I have tried it myself several times. I was afraid he would think me a coward, and I said, well, I'll try it. 
stretch yourself out on the undormeuse. A little uneasy, I seated myself on the low couch covered in crepe de chine and stretched myself full length, and was at once bathed in the delicious odor of mignonette. I opened my mouth in order to breathe it in, for my mind had already become stupefied and forgetful of the past, and was a prey, in the first stages of asphyxia, to the enchanting intoxication of a destroying and magic opium. Someone shook me by the arm. Oh, oh, monsieur, said the secretary, laughing. It looks to me as if you were almost caught. But a voice, a real voice, and no longer a dream voice, greeted me with a pleasant intonation. Good morning, monsieur. How goes it? My dream was over. I saw the Seine distinctly in the sunlight, and, coming along the path, the guard champetre of the district, who with his right hand touched his kepi braided in silver. I replied, Good morning, Marinel. Where are you going? I am going to look at a drowned man whom they fished up near the Morillon, another who has thrown himself into the soup. He even took off his trousers in order to tie his legs together with them. End of section 184. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. End of complete original short stories of Guy de Maupassant. Translated by Albert M. C. McMaster, A. E. Henderson, and Luis Quesada.